right, it's 9 a.m. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, January 30th, 2024 meeting to order. And with that, um, after a little reshuffling, lovely clerk, call the roll. And just to let everybody know, Supervisor Friend is participating remotely um, from Sacramento today, but he is in attendance at this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Hernandez. Here. McPherson. Here. And Cummings. Here. Um, I'd like to see if there's any uh, member of the board who would like to dedicate the moment of silence. Supervisor Hernandez. Yeah, we have a... One of our veterans from one of our veterans from Watsonville, uh, Henry Garcia, recently passed, and he was very active in both, you know, the American Legion there, and just really involved in the community too. So I'd like to have a moment of silence for him. Any other supervisor want to dedicate a moment of silence? Seeing none, I'd like to invite us all to take a moment of silence for Henry Garcia. All right, if you could all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. What do I do to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all? The okay, next item on our agenda is consideration of late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions to consent and regular agendas. And so I'd like to ask the CAO, Carlos Palacios, if there have been any additions or deletions to the agenda. Yes, we have uh, one item, uh, Chair Cummings and members of the board. We have on the consent agenda on item number 24, there's additional materials. There's a revised attachment A and B, page 90, which is replaced to correct the threshold amounts listed. That concludes the corrections to the agenda. Okay, thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is items to be removed from consent to the regular agenda. Are there any board members who would like to remove any item from consent to the board, to the regular agenda? Chair, I'd like to remove item 51. Uh, item 51, approving the agreement with Integral Consulting in the amount of 692-608. Okay. Any other board member that would like to remove an item from consent to the regular agenda? And so just for a point of uh, order, where would that item then be heard on the regular agenda? Give me one moment. I'm going to consult with the clerk at the same time, and I believe it's going to end up being item 11.1. .1. Is that right? Yes, counsel. I do believe it would become item 11.1 .1 as the final item on the regular agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, with that, we will open up um, We open our meeting up to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to um, make comments on any item on our closed session agenda or our regular session agenda if you're not able to stay here and also to comment on anything that's not currently on our agenda. And you will have two minutes, so I'd like to invite the first speaker to the podium. Good morning. My name is David Schwartz. I'm a candidate for supervisor in District 2. Um, I, I'd like to uh, make a couple of comments, and hopefully in the two minutes that I have, uh, which is not very long. Uh, first thing is a rant. The second will be a suggestion. The first rant is last time I was here, I got a parking ticket. Um, I think what we could do to get more people in here is do away with parking violations during board meetings. That, that would be a, a great thing to help people uh, get in here. Uh, I thought I was in the right spot, but apparently I wasn't. So a bad on me. Okay. Now the important thing, um, I'm sure you guys have been hearing this and I hope 
you've been listening to this, there is a big problem coming to the County of Santa Cruz, a huge problem. There is an unfunded liability that we have for pensions that is somewhere in the neighborhood of $900 million over the next 10 years. And if we don't do something about it now, we're gonna be buried in these costs that will literally take away all the money that we have for services in the county. Now, what I would suggest is number one, right now, you guys put it on your agenda as soon as you can to do away with defined benefit plans in the county. Okay, no employees from one point on will have that. Now, what that's doing to us is that's creating this unfunded liability because we're paying into the PERS system. We're paying 5% of those costs into the PERS system. That's going to go to 12% this year, but that's going to go even higher every year thereafter. Um, if, if we had something like Social Security and 401k, that would also give people an opportunity to borrow against their 401k. They can't borrow against the defined benefit plan. Maybe they need an extra 50k to buy that first house. Something to think about very seriously. But this needs to happen now. We cannot wait because 10 years from now, $900 million is that's going to wipe us out. Okay, so think about this and do something about it, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Damon Bruder, and I'm speaking uh, on an item. I don't know what number it is, but it's on the consent agenda, and it's concerning the sunsetting of the Syringe Services Program Advisory Commission. Um, I am the duly elected chairperson of that commission and have been so for the better part of four years since the commission was incepted. Um, I very much appreciate the, the opportunity to serve our community in this capacity and to help bring uh, change to the syringe services program. We've been able to accomplish a couple of really good things in the short time we've been here. Um, I was a little blindsided that we were going to be sunsetted. Uh, and I understand that we're not the most important thing on the books right now. There's a lot of other things going on. Uh, but as a private citizen, I do have concerns about reverting to the problems we were having previously um, with excess litter, uh, syringe litter on the beaches, on the creeks, in the parks, that kind of thing, um, because of not having any um, any oversight by the county or the public, the syringe services program can, you know, I, I would believe can, can change the way they're doing things. Um, uh, and it would revert back to having excess litter all over the place, which is why the syringe services program committee was accepted in the first place to try and bring better, um, uh, harm reduction practices to the county. Uh, again, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to serve our community. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair, I just want, um, that's item number 10. And I think we're going to have a report from the syringe services commission in March. And I think we're really waiting for that. We, I just to let you know. As far as I know, we will not be providing a report, but I don't know for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Wayne Barnes. I have commercial property in the Live Oak area, which um, is before the board to change the assessment value on those properties um, by a report by Bowman and Williams. And um, I'm not here about the money. I understand the need for services. However, I am opposed venomously to the methodology that Bowman and Williams came up with to disperse EBUs, effective benefit units, um, I think is a capricious and opinionated way to, de to decide who pays for um, the services in this area. I would suggest to the board that you take a more practical uh, look at um, assessing these according to assess valuation. I think it's far more um, equitable. I think it's fair to all the property owners. I mean, um, just in my instance alone, based on the engineer's report, my live oak improvement on this year's taxes was $22.20. According to the engineer's report and all the effective benefit units they came up with, my new assessment is $556. I think it's outrageous to load commercial properties 
with the maintenance that benefits the entire CSE 9 district. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker in person, you can approach the podium. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Lavodi. I'm the chairman and founder of the Monterey Bay International Trade Association, the leading global trade promotion and investment service organization in California for over 28 years, headquartered here in Santa Cruz. Uh, in recent years, our organization has been focusing on climate change and environmental degradation business solutions. And to that effect, uh, we formed a strategic alliance with uh, B.B. Wong, Inc., B.B. Wong, uh, a very successful realtor here in Santa Cruz for over 40 years and with a global network. Uh, she was one of the first, uh, she was the first uh, Century 21 China uh, agent, American agent, selected uh, years ago. Anyway, we formed this coalition. We went to a conference uh, uh asian real estate association of america conference in uh, mexico city uh last april we met all the leading uh, real estate development people in mexico and um uh, we uh started a project called kelmex 21st century villages that addresses both affordable housing and uh, climate change uh, solutions. And to that effect, we uh, formed uh, a relationship with a consortium, business consortium in Mexico. And now we're developing that in California to simultaneously develop two affordable housing, zero emission infrastructure uh, villages uh, in California and in Mexico simultaneously uh, benefiting from the USMCA free trade agreement and the McKeelia uh border uh, tariff benefits to collectively together build these two identical uh, affordable housing, zero emission infrastructure uh, uh, villages. And I just wanted to inform the uh, the county and the area that we're looking uh, as we build this consortium for the right place to do this in California. And we're looking at Pajaro Valley as being a great solution because not only is it uh, creating uh, uh, villages that address affordable housing and climate change, but also it is addressing uh, job creation because the NACS R&D centers for the new infrastructure technologies you, that are zero emission. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the board. I'm Sierra Ryan. I'm the county's Water Resources Program Manager. Um, since 2004, water resources management activities at the county have been consolidated under environmental health. At the time the board took that action, they requested an annual report, which is item 44 on the agenda today. This report, um, which we produce annually, has input from 10 different agencies, partner agencies throughout the county, as well as four different departments within the county. And it encompasses everything from fisheries resources management to large water supply projects that produce the water that our community relies upon. Some highlights this year include the impacts of the weather whiplash we've been experiencing where we had three consecutive dry years followed by record rainfalls of 160% of normal. Uh, we also talk about the fact that this year, last year in 2003, we had the lowest municipal water use since we've began record taking in 1984. So even though our population has grown significantly, we are using less water as a community than we were in 1984. We also talk about the activities um, undertaken by our water quality lab to investigate the new emerging concerns associated with harmful algal blooms and how to detect them and message them throughout the county. I brought printed copies for all of you, which I will leave with the clerk um, so that you can use them for as references throughout the year. So thank you so much for your support for our program and for water resources management throughout the county. Thank you and thank you for your office and all the good work that you do for our community. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Rhonda Reyna, and I have been coming to you with a severe problem for over a year. I'm a woman who has experienced severe domestic violence and abuse, 
and worse yet, experience post-separation abuse by government agents who are in place, who are supposed to be implementing the Violence Against Women Act that was started by President Bill Clinton in 1994, but instead those billions, if not trillions of dollars have been weaponized against mothers and children like myself. I'm at my wits end. So I'm just going to go to my Bible. I'm a woman of God. I'm a child of God. I feel like I'm up against the spirit of Goliath, the spirit of Pharaoh, the spirit of Jezebel and the Nephilim. And all I can do is read a parable. Now, Jesus, and this is from Luke 18. Now, Jesus was telling the disciples a parable to make the point that at all times they ought to pray and not give up and lose heart, saying, in a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and had no respect for man. There was a desperate widow in that city, and she kept coming to him and saying, give me justice and legal protection from my adversary. For a time, he would not. But later he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow continues to bother me, I will give her justice and legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will be an intolerable annoyance and she will wear me out. I'm not going away. I want my daughter back. I want justice and I want all my abusers prosecuted. It is your job to make that happen. Thank you. Before the next speaker goes, I'd just like to see if there's any other member of the public who's here who'd like to speak in person if you could please get in line um we'll that will and he will be the last member of the public here in person before we move to online comments so please uh just really coming back and saying thank you for the hard work that you put into retaking a look at all of the commissions and the stipend i just want to say thank you for those of you i've had conversations with um i have something unique Hopefully, at some time from vision, it will become a reality. And that is an economic game plan that you're participatory in to create a business so big in our county that it makes money and returns 100% of its profit back into the community for what we're going to jumpstart with the new commission you're going to put in place, thanks to Carlos and others. Of youth empowerment with a revisit to the youth commission i know that i was looking for more information uh, last week and staff here couldn't find it on your county and so i'm just here to learn what i can uh, as you get into that subject but if you know what paul newman did then certainly the county and city of santa cruz could create that kind of a collaboration for a company i can't speak into it in the two minutes but i sure can over a cup of coffee and i guarantee you if you come into my kitchen it'll be a starbucks so i just want to say thank you let's make that county and city that i live in <laughs> let's make it what it could be to be an example for the whole state thank you if you do check out student leadership bring your resource to cabrillo and its student government thank you again thank you next speaker good morning i'm miley Ernest. i'm the director of program operations for the uh sorry for people's first formerly known as the free guide and i just wanted to say thank you on the behalf of people people's first for the funding for the severe weather shelter um we ran it the first part of the year and served over 500 people that came through overnight. And on the eve of gearing up to do that for the rain that's coming tomorrow, um, we're going to be open for 24 hours a day through Monday or sorry, through Friday afternoon. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it's a huge thing to do for folks that are unsheltered and outside right now. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Wow, 2024 is really opening out to be quite the interesting year. Now we have the New World, excuse me, the WF puppet, Greg Abbott. What's he actually up to in um, Texas? Really kind of interesting what's going on. You know, there's a gentleman 
named Rowan Atchison that gave a speech about 10 years ago about free speech, saying that free speech was more important than a roof over your head. You know, we should all talk to each other, all these litigation and crap when stuff is going on. So, you know, we're very fortunate. We have two elections, one coming up pretty soon, another one that may or may not happen for all kinds of reasons. But this is something I wrote, and it affects all of you and Ryan Coonerty and uh, John Leopold. What a Civonomicon. As two elections loom this year, one being in less than 60 days, where are my observations about a man who I could now make hundreds of observations the last four years? My vote. I absolutely support public debate and fully support life in prison for Manu and the other seven or eight individuals that make up the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. I have better attendance than all of you men the past four years. I would have had really good attendance in the city of Santa Cruz, but that was those meetings were shut down for two years. There's a lot of stuff going on that you guys are just glazing. You know, I don't stand to the Pledge of Allegiance to the corporate U.S. flag, corporate California flag, or the corporate pedophile flag. When you go outside this building, you have a U.S. and a California flag that do not have their corporate pirate fringe. You guys are operating on five or six legal jurisdictions that I could describe. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we have one more member of the public. Is there any other member of the public who's in person who'd like to comment on the agenda? The last speaker here in person, and then we'll move to online. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I have a number of comments, but first and foremost, off of the agenda, I want to implore that your board uh, send a complaint uh, to the California Public Utilities Commission uh, that will halt any uh, ability for AT&T to act as a last resort carrier in the state, but in this county. What many people do not understand this letter dated January 10th, 2024, a message from the California Public Utilities Commission means is that AT&T wants to stop providing landline service to the rural people. Hardwired landline service is the most dependable telephone service in the rural areas in emergencies. When the power goes out, my neighbors who are not, who do not have a landline service have no telephone service, no telephone service. So please write to the PUC and uh, protest the two uh, requests that AT&T has before them and uh, to stop landline service. On the consent agenda today, I protest item 20 uh, in moving ahead with the digital wallet. This is not good for the people and I do not support it. And I ask that you stop it immediately, even though it is a free thing that the county looks to be getting, it is not in good service to the public. Um, number 30, I do not support the county voting affirmatively on measure N. I think this is unfair because the county is a large land owner and will dissolve, uh, dilute the public's vote on this. The county has an interest in measure N, a financial interest, and I think it's a conflict of resolution to support in such a big way a vote affirming it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this time, we're going to move to the online um, public comments. Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Tony, your microphone is now available. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Nunez. I live in District 6. I'm a resident, a lifelong resident of Watsonville, and I'm a volunteer for the Yes on Measure End campaign. I want to thank you all for your ongoing support of Watsonville Community Hospital and for bringing the resolution of support for Measure End to today's meeting. Measure End would allow the Watsonville Community Hospital, which is now under nonprofit community ownership, to continue to improve its services and finally cut all ties with out-of-state for-profit companies and investment firms. It would also allow us to nearly double the capacity of Watsonville Community Hospital's emergency room to continue to meet the growing healthcare needs of our aging community in South County. The County Board of Supervisors this year and years past has emphasized equity. 
There is no greater investment in equity than ensuring everyone in your jurisdiction has access to quality health care within their own community. Approving this resolution of support, you would add your name to our growing list of supporters, which includes the Central Coast Alliance for Health, County of Monterey, City of Watsonville, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, the Pajaronian Salud para la Gente, the County, uh, Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce, Santa Cruz County Farm Bureau, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, the Central Committee, the Central Democratic Committee, the Mid-County Democratic Committee, and the Monterey County Democratic Central Committee. Thank you so much for your ongoing support of Watsonville Community Hospital. You can find more information about Measure N on yesonmeasurein.net. I also want to uh, invite all of you to our official Measure N kickoff on Saturday at 9.30 a.m. at Community Bridges headquarters in downtown Watsonville. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Call in user ending in 9902. Your microphone's now available. Thank you. My name is Nina Beattie. Uh, AT&T, as Ms. Steinbrunner said, wants to discontinue landline telephone service in California and has asked the CPUC to allow it to do so. If approved, customers would have no telephone service and no 911 service in a power outage or disaster once their batteries die. I ask the board to oppose this measure to the CPUC. Copper line landline service is essential infrastructure, particularly for rural areas, um, much like water pipes or highways are for everyone. It's built to withstand most disasters and provide uninterrupted service for days, weeks, or even months without when the electricity goes out. AT&T's contract with the state also as carrier of last resort means everyone gets service without discrimination, without extra fees or credit checks, and AT&T wants to eliminate this contract. If approved, customers, particularly in rural areas, would have few or no options for any type of dependable service. Also, in the event of a fire, landlines may be the only way customers can get evacuation alerts. In the Northern California fires, customers repeatedly said if they didn't have landlines, they would have died in the fires. Customers received a notice, an important AT&T notice recently about public comment hearings, but with no explanation about the proceeding. Um, the nearest in-person hearing is next week in Clovis on February 6th, and there's a virtual one in March 19, uh, that, where people can call in and oppose this um, application by AT&T. So I urge people to retain those notices so they know when they can call in and to oppose this. And I ask again the board to oppose this uh, measure by this application by AT&T. It's application 23.03.003 at the, the CPUC. Those notices were very important and there was no explanation for why people would need to comment about these proceedings. It's about the carrier of last resort and about copper line landlines, which are essential service. Thank, Thank you. you. Celia, your microphone is now available. Good morning, I'm speaking to item 10. My name is Celia Berry and I am the District 2 appointee to the Emergency Medical Care Commission as well as the Commission's co-chair. I would like to respectfully request that the board postpone transitioning the Commission's consolidation with another committee until the Commission can meet and thoughtfully review and respond to the proposed recommendations. I share the board's goal of ensuring that county staff is used appropriately to support committees and commissions and look forward to implementing strategies that are respectful of this goal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, I also urge you to help save landlines and defend our copper uh, analog landline network, which we and the public, we all paid for. Uh, analog copper landline telephones provide the highest quality, reliable, affordable, and safe voice service available. But now big telecom companies like AT&T and Verizon are trying to pull the plug on landlines by forcing people to use less regulated 
and unreliable but more profitable cell phones or voice over internet technologies without any coherent plan to keep people safely and reliably connected. A valuable source of information is savelandlines.org and also um, the protest of Nina Beatty before the Public Utilities Commission on application 2303003. You can read the uh, entire protest. I also received a notice of pending regulatory application from AT&T. Part of what it states is that AT&T as the carrier of last resort, resort, and I quote this part, means that we, AT&T, must provide traditional landline phone service to any potential customer in our service territory. I would encourage people to call to AT&T that they need to provide traditional landline service. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Garrett. Is there any other? Yes, Chair, we do have additional speakers online. Caroline, your microphone is now available. Good morning. My name is Caroline. I live in District 1. Um, And I just wanted to continue to encourage the board to consider passing a ceasefire resolution. Let me see here. Yes, or not yesterday, on the 27th of um, January, our Santa Cruz County Democratic Central Committee approved a resolution. Um, And I just want to quote the chair, Andrew Goldencrans, about that process um, in case it's of inspiration. This resolution balances the need for peaceful, sustainable cessation of violence and follows the diplomatic efforts on the ground by our and other governments to get to a better place. We had a respectful, thorough discussion among people with different perspectives and got to an almost consensus resolution. It ultimately passed 24 to three. So I I, um, suggest maybe that you consider a resolution like that one. Um, Also since the last meeting, um, the ICJ ruled that Israel is plausibly committing genocide and to date 66 members of Congress have called for a ceasefire. Um, Even after the ICJ ruling, Israeli settlers and government officials attended a conference to build illegal settlements in Gaza. Um, And in the last 24 hours, 215 Palestinians were killed and 300 injured. Um, And so, yeah, I just wanted to encourage us to continue um, looking for a diplomatic way to promote peace. Um, And also, as someone who grew up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, I am an advocate for saving landlines because it is pretty scary um, not having access uh, when your cell is not working. Um, And that is it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Call in user ending in 1192. Your microphone's now available. You are unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm calling about a um, the item 20 and the digital wallet. And this is uh, something going on in Europe as well. And it points to all the problems that uh, are in this system. And a, society, a civil society group wrote a letter to the EU about privacy concerns. And it will present, they say, an unprecedented, unprecedented risk for European, Europeans in their online and offline life unless privacy and anti-discrimination safeguards are introduced. So it, in an open letter, the group urged European Union officials to reconsider the current tra- trajectory. Um, The main concerns of the group is that the digital wallet may spell the death of anonymity leading to over-identification and a real name internet. The regulations could also introduce a unique and persistent identifier for every citizen allowing big tech actors to track their behavior. 
In its current form, the European digital identity system would be a gift for Google and Facebook to undermine the privacy of EU citizens. The letter notes, this will impact everyone in the EU and put them at a lower privacy level than people in other world regions. Other issues include intrusive functions and susceptibility to system failures and cyber attacks and lack of redress for those who are excluded from the system. So in China, they have a social credit score where they are tracked for everything they do, their opinions or political opinions, and they can be excluded from this system instantly for something the government doesn't like. And I think that is where this system is going, and I am against item 20, and I urge you to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michelle, your microphone's now available. As a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Good morning. I'm a resident of District 2. I also have two items to share. I'm also supporting keeping the landlines for the residents that need it. The second item, I'm asking you to work on a ceasefire resolution in Gaza. As of today, the amount of death is equal to the population of Santa Cruz, and the number of displaced population is equal to the population of San Jose and San Francisco combined. I'm asking you to work on a ceasefire resolution in Gaza to stop this killing. The Santa Cruz County Democratic Committee, under the leadership of Andrew Golden Krantz, passed a resolution. I ask you to adopt that resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Yellen family, your microphone's now available. As a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Good morning. Can you hear me? I hope you can. My name yes. is Mark Yeldon. For those who do not know me, I am and have been an emergency physician and one of the EMS managers in our community for the past 37 years. During this time, I have worked closely with our county's EMS division as well as with our local law firm, nine local provider agencies and medical groups. I have sat on many of the related EMS committees and shared several. I also had the honor of facing and sharing my thoughts with several supervisors over the past decades. I have currently served in the EMCC as a commissioner representing the Santa Cruz Medical Society. I share these details not to boost my LinkedIn profile, but rather to hopefully authenticate my comments presented here. The EMCC is a vital and critical commission that serves to advise the members of our board of supervisors. That is the mandate. It brings together at the same table the required expertise of trained specialists um, from local public and private agencies and institutions that through collaboration and investigation help to advise the board on critical issues specifically relating to EMS. The EMCC is in the unique position to take a broad view greater elevation to observe, monitor, question, comment, and advise the many and frequently changing aspects of our EMS system. While others may disagree, EMS management is a critical specialty requiring critical specialists with practical and focused experience and with deep community involvement. It is profoundly different than most other aspects of healthcare and requires a different approach. As such, I humbly but strongly advise members of this board to preserve the EMCC. Additionally, I would suggest that the EMCC be charged with renewing its charter and activities in order to streamline the process and bring these recommendations back to the board that will be the date for the discussion. Thank you for your time. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who uh, was here to comment today. I just wanted to see if there's any um, comments on anything that was mentioned from the CAO or any relevant staff. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. 
for any comments, questions on items that are on the consent agenda with the exception of item number 51, which has been moved to the regularly scheduled agenda. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. On a couple of items, uh, item number 16, the annual comprehensive financial report. I want to thank uh, Edith Driscoll, who is here today, uh, our auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector for this report. Yeah, she's all that in one. Uh, uh, it speaks really highly of the high professionalism of our county and devotes managing the public's money and provides a complete transparency of how that uh, money is spent and its our overall operations. Um, I want to thank your staff for this report uh, and the report that uh, receiving the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting, which is the highest recognition in government accounting and finance reporting. Uh, so congratulations, and in, con in conjunction uh, with the recent California State Association of Counties Award for our online budget tool, uh, overseen by Mark Ben Mattel, uh, I'm very proud that Santa Cruz is recognized for excellence in regarding our financial management system and letting the public know how we are spending our money. So thank you very much. Um, Similar to our financial reporting over the past few years on item number 18, the strategic initiative update, um, over the past few years, the board has uh, and the community have seen an evolution and improvement in uh, the transparency in our overall uh, county operations. And I encourage members of the public uh, to read this report. It's item number 18 on today's agenda and see for themselves how comprehensive uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, a comprehensive strategic plan uh, can result in continuous improvement in how we serve the community. And finally, on uh, item number 41, this is very, very welcome to me, a state grant for the Big Basin Water System. I want to thank uh, Dave Reed, our Director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, as well as Sierra Ryan, who we heard from this morning our uh, Water Resources Manager, for th their work in obtaining this grant from the state. Um, this we're seeing an unprecedented level of collaboration and support among the state resource agencies. It's taken a lot of time to get there because this Big Basin Water Company is a private company that is overseen by the state and not the county for its operations. And the county and the court appointed receiver uh, is charting a brighter future for the customers of the Big Basin Water Company. I wish it could have come earlier, but uh, this is the process that we had, we did follow. And uh, we're gonna have, we're having some great results. So without this funding of over $800,000, more than a 500 households uh, could have been without drinking water within a couple of months. And uh, we are fortunate there is uh, an also a substantial carve out to the study for a private public uh, consolidation, possibly with the San Lorenzo Valley County Water District, uh, which is again, a separate agency, uh, but uh, we'll look forward to that uh, in the future to hope that can become a reality. But uh, I wanna thank everybody involved in this. This has been a long process and it comes just at the right time. So we don't have to cut off water systems, uh, uh, water system in the big basin area. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one item I'd, I'd like to comment on, which is item 55, approving plans, specifications, and engineer's estimate for the Children's Crisis Center. Uh, this, of course, is a much needed facility uh, on the public safety campus in Live Oak. Um, when uh, just very recently, this board discussed that uh, we'd like to see some uh, projects considered for project labor agreements. Um, this one actually came to mind as one that would be a, a good fit. I mean, it's over $12 million. It's a vertical project. We want it done on time. Um, and so I don't know if anyone here uh, in on staff would like to comment, but um, I mean, I'm inclined to suggest that we put this out to bid with, uh, with the project labor agreement in place. So, yeah. Yes, uh, we did. Uh, this project has been being worked on for over a year, and there's a great deal of urgency to get it out. Uh, we are working on a, a comprehensive project labor agreement master agreement for the county, and we have been in contact uh, with the trade unions about that. Uh, however, with this project, we're worried that trying to do a, a one-off 
uh, PLA agreement would slow it down. And we're under a great deal of urgency to get this project bid and constructed because of the, the great need there is for um, children's uh, crisis uh, healthcare. So for that reason, uh, we put it through without a PLA at this point, but we are working uh, very diligently uh, to form a master agreement and bring to the board for consideration in the next few months. Okay, okay. I, mean, I certainly agree. It's, this is an urgent need. And so um, I'll accept the recommendation that uh, we proceed as is and look forward to seeing um, your suggestions on a master PLA or other projects where we could utilize uh, PLAs. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Friend, do you have any comments on the consent? Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, just briefly on the item 20, the digital wallet appreciation for the staff's work uh, for providing another level of interaction and accessibility of the county for uh, those that are interested in using it. Uh, appreciation for uh, the caller on the hospital measure and this board's consideration after we received the presentation at our last board meeting uh, to, to formally come out now in support of the district's measure. I think it would be hard to find a greater investment that could be made in health equity and the preservation of the stability of our health system than this. Uh, without the passage of this measure, uh, there are some pretty significant and dire potential consequences, but, uh, but on the positive side, with the passage of the measure, there would be investments in South County in particular, um, health care service delivery that would be pretty unprecedented and, and could only benefit the community uh, at large. I just want to also acknowledge on item 41, I just want to acknowledge our colleague, Supervisor McPherson, who has been working so strongly on this big basin water preservation project and uh, the work of Director Reed and Sierra Ryan that was mentioned as well as our CAO. But um, I know that it couldn't have happened without Supervisor McPherson's work and that of his team. And so just an acknowledgement to you, Supervisor McPherson, I know you did a lot of work both at the local and state level to make sure that this actually came about. Uh, the last item, item 56, which is uh, the Green Valley multi-use trail. In some respects, it's it's actually much broader than that. It's it's just such a significant investment in in safety and transportation equity in South County in a in an area that I share with uh, my esteemed colleague, Supervisor Hernandez. In that area, as Supervisor Hernandez knows, it's an area that has had uh, that it, that receives a lot of both bike and pedestrian traffic. Uh, it's also an area that a lot of kids walk to school and a lot of uh, families use to get to Pinto Lake Park. Uh, so any sort of investments that we can make in safety in that area uh, will both increase access but also save lives. And so appreciation to uh, Steve Wiesner and the Public Works, who I know has been leading the effort on this. It's been a very challenging project to get funded, but we were able to find not just locally, but uh, through state funds to his diligent work and that of this board, this funding. So a great project once it gets built. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friends, Supervisor Hernandez. Just a few brief comments on 29, 30, and 56. Um, you know, I'm glad that we're doing this Santa Cruz cleanup, cleanup day. Uh, it, what it does is it establishes a, a dedicated day for community-wide community environmental education, cleanup efforts across the county to improve environmental health, public well-being, and beauty and jurisdictions, jurisdictions throughout Santa Cruz County. So I'm really excited about that. And 30, um, you know, the hospital is really important to not just our community, but it benefits um, healthcare systems here in North County to make sure to sure that we got healthcare in South County means that we don't impact hospitals over here in in North County. So it really is about um, health equity, and you know I fully support it. And item fifty six, I'm happy that this this is going out to bid uh, on Green Valley Road. There is it's an area that has. It's three parks, uh, two county, one in my district, one in uh, Supervisor Friend's district, and we have one city park there, um, Pino Lake, and a neighborhood market store that a lot of youth, young people, and just everyone uh, uses that road. And if you ever drive by there, there's plenty of memorials for people that have been run over as pedestrians, as um, bicyclists. So it's a critical need in that area. And I'm just happy that we got it going. And that's it. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Um, I have some comments on some of the items that have already been addressed and then uh, some additional comments. I'll try to be brief. Um, item number 18, I just want to thank staff um, again for all their 
ongoing work to help address equity. And uh, this update to our county strategic initiatives really shows their commitment to uh, this work. And so I just want to thank you all for your ongoing support of that. At number 29, I want to thank Supervisor Hernandez for reaching out um, to include me um, as someone who could bring forward the proposal for Santa Cruz County Cleanup Day. Um, I do want to recognize, though, that we uh, we have a number of environmental organizations that we've partnered with for years, and I hope that we can continue to support those organizations as well. Some of them haven't seen increases in their contracts with the county, and I think it's worth us taking a look at um, you know, how we can better support some of the nonprofits that also do environmental cleanups and education in our community. Um, item number 30, uh, I want to thank Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Hernandez for bringing forward this resolution to support Measure N. Um, I'm fully supportive of Watson Mill Hospital, and the county has done a great job of helping to uh, save that hospital um, from bankruptcy. And so I hope that we can show, share our full support um, for that effort. And hopefully after March, we will have a direct funding stream to keep that hospital open. Um, items number 36 through 38. I just want to thank our commissions um, for their hard work. These are three um, annual reports that um, are coming before the board and just demonstrate you know, how important it is for us to continue to have community engagement with our commissions and, uh, and acknowledge the work that they do to keep us informed about their work. Item number 41, I just want to share the um, what's been expressed by my colleagues around getting the funding to support Big Basin Water. I'm um, just hearing about how the potential loss of that um, water company could have impacted residents was um, really concerning. And so I just want to thank everyone for their hard work to help secure those funds. And hopefully we can, you know, have a better water company and water services um, in that region. Um, item number 45, uh, this is... Uh, revenue agreement with California Alliance for Health. And I just want to thank our staff again for all the work that they're doing on homelessness. Um, sometimes we don't get the credit that we deserve for the ongoing work that we're doing at the county for homelessness, but just want to acknowledge and thank uh, the county staff for all their hard work to continue to seek out funding so that we can continue to serve some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Um, and which is also related to item number 47. Um, I really want to thank staff for working with our office. This is an agreement between the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville uh, to provide winter shelter and also disaster shelter. And I'll just say that back when I was mayor during the fires and we had to open the uh, civic downtown, there's a lot of confusion over who was supposed to be running that facility. And then um, during my time on the Santa Cruz City Council, there were years when the city didn't have a winter shelter. And for many members of the community, they were really concerned as to why we weren't offering winter shelter and why we weren't supporting some of the other services. And so this has been a big priority of mine um, after joining the board. And so I really want to thank staff and the city of Santa Cruz for working collaboration to come to an agreement for how we're going to be able to provide winter um, and disaster shelter for people experiencing homelessness in our community. And then uh, lastly, just want to um, thank staff for all their work on item number 55 to um, get this, you know, Children's Crisis Center moving forward. I share the sem sentiments brought up by uh, Supervisor Koenig around us trying to have PLAs and, and moving forward with that. So we'll, that's another conversation to be had. But I think that given the need for the, these kinds of services that um, we should probably get this project going as quickly as possible. And so just want to thank everybody for their hard work on these items and all the other items on our consent agenda. And with that, I will bring it back to the board to see if there's a motion uh, to move the consent item with the exception of item number 51, which was pulled by Supervisor Koenig. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. So we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor Hernandez. And given that Supervisor Friend is remote, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll call vote. Certainly. Supervisor McPherson. Yes. Koenig. Aye. Hernandez. Yes. Friend. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. So with that, we will move on to our regular agenda. First item on our agenda is a public hearing to consider proposed 2024-2025 benefit assessment rates for county service area number 9E streetscape maintenance request the submittal of ballots for the proposed fiscal year 2024-2025 benefit assessments continue the public hearing to April 30th, 2024 and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO director of 
community development and infrastructure. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Machado. All right, thank you. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. Matt Machado, Director of Community Development Infrastructure. Thank you for the introduction. The item before you is a public hearing uh, for the benefit assessment rate increase for CSA 9E. Uh, today does conclude the uh, the election to increase assessments for streetscape maintenance and county service area 9E, which encompasses Live Oak and Soquel area. Uh, CSA 9E provides streetscaping on roadways and the care and maintenance of over 1,600 trees uh, within the boundaries of the former redevelopment area of Live Oak and Soquel. So today uh, it will be necessary for the board to hear objections or protests, if any, close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and continue the public hearing to April 30th, 2024 to allow for the tabulation of the ballots and certification of the ballot proceedings. Uh, staff is here today, both our consultant and our, and our own staff to answer any questions you may have. And I certainly can attempt to answer any questions you may have, but with that, that concludes our, our uh, staff presentation and turn it to you for any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Director Machado. Well, I will say that uh, we know the public wants these services. My office hears uh, extensively from the public, particularly in the spring, when uh, the weeds tend to outpace uh, our budget capacity for the current CSA 9E. Uh, fund, which, uh, as was stated in the report, I think has something along the lines of uh, thirty eight thousand uh, dollars a year or thereabouts, um, and uh, hasn't been increased since nineteen ninety eight, uh, which means that uh, inflation has effectively cut uh, our budget capacity in half um, since the last time this was increased. One of the things I do appreciate about uh, this proposal is that it would tie the fee to inflation so that we do not have to go back uh, to the public and ask for this again because after all the elections themselves do cost money um i would ask you know i think there's there's certainly some logic in asking uh, commercial properties to pay a little bit more given that they're actually doing business in the area um if, if we have someone from bowman williams i'd be interested to hear um you know about exactly how that rate was set um you know, and I think, I mean, we, we heard from the gentleman uh, who mentioned that his, his fee is, would go up to $556 uh, or thereabouts. And I think that um, it, by my math, that mean, would mean that uh, that is over 12 parcels, right? I mean, because the, the in, unless one parcel can get, a commercial parcel can have more EBUs, uh, effective benefit units, um, you know, I think that that is, is actually represents a pretty significant amount of uh, square footage in the first district. Yeah, no, I think your math is correct. And uh, I'll, I'll comment on that. And uh, if need be, we can bring our consultant to the, to the dice as well. Uh, so it is true that commercial properties do generate more traffic, both uh, vehicle traffic, pedestrian traffic. And so the theory is that, that they receive more benefit from these amenities that we provide through 9E. And so we've looked at uh, industry standards to, to make it fair and equitable. And so the six to one ratio uh, does appear to be the right uh, amount of assessment compared to a single family. So a single family residence is a one EBU and commercial properties are a six. And that's based upon the increased traffic and both foot and vehicle traffic and the demand for additional services, which, which they certainly generate. And so we think it is uh, the correct amount. We think it's equitable. We think it's uh it's analyzed properly and certainly can answer any more questions you may have on that. Sure. Well, um, our street trees have gotten bigger since the last time we increased this fee and our sidewalks have gotten older and uh, need more maintenance. And of course, the, the weeds themselves have gotten more established. So uh, we could use some more resources to deal with the uh, maintenance of this area. Of course, people complain that we should take money from the general fund in order to do that. But uh, as you well know, Director Machado, we have many CSAs throughout the county uh, that deal with fire protection, stormwater management, mosquito abatement. And so, you know, if we were to pull on this block and um, try to take money from the general fund for streetscape maintenance in Live Oak, I think ultimately uh, every CSA would ask for the same treatment and the whole Jenga tower would would come crashing down. So this is really uh, the most straightforward way to uh, address the additional needs of this area. Um, I guess we will hear back on April 30th as far as uh, the results of the election. That's correct. Yeah. And of course, one additional note, I, I understand correctly, um, 
the, the vote is weighted by EBUs. Is that correct? That is correct. So commercial property owners who are concerned about the increased fees ultimately do get um, greater say in how this election turns out. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other supervisors with comments on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll open it up to the public for members of the public to comment on this item if you haven't done so already. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner. I do not live in the Live Oak or SoCal area, but as uh, one who is concerned about proper and transparent government process, I do not see an engineer's report associated with this, what's being called an assess benefit assessment increase. It is my understanding of the California Constitution, Article 13, Section C and D, that an engineer's report is required in a Prop 218 vote uh, and tax or assessment increase to show that there is a justifiable and transparent calculation of the proportional benefit of the, those who will be taxed. I don't see that anywhere. So if you can help me find that, I would appreciate it. And that would help also support the question as to why there is such a disparity in the taxing uh, level. Thank you for explaining what EBU is. <laughs> I couldn't find that acronym defined anywhere, so thank you. Um, and again, um, I did suggest it, that some monies be used from the general fund because there is general benefit. And that's the other thing that the engineer's report must uh, clarify transparently, the difference between the uh, benefit to the property owner themselves and to the general public us passing by or coming to these commercial areas. That's general benefit, which must be identified and separate from the uh, benefit that is attached to the property parcel and for which those owners are being assessed. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the, sir, unfortunately, since you spoke on this item already today, um, you can't come back up for a public comment on this. You get to rebut his, uh, Suggestions? I'm sorry, not at this point in time. Any other members of the public who are here present who would like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, we'll go to the clerk to see if there's anyone online who would like to speak on this item. We do have speakers online. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett. <clears throat> Benefit assessment means more taxes for people to pay. And I see this on many an agenda, more and more taxes. Why are we being taxed more and more? Uh, because over 50% of our taxes go to the military budget. That's taken out of this county for services that could be provided. We need, um, we need to redo, it's just siphoned out. It's like a theft from the public and then the public is to pay more. Real benefit would be keeping that money in our county for what we need as citizens of the county. Just this weekend, uh, billboards put up by World Beyond War have this statement. Three percent of Garrett, the I need to ask. I need budget, to ask how this relates to this item. I, excuse me. Would end starvation on Earth. I would like this board to advocate for keeping money in our county that we need. And to quote Martin Luther King Jr., he said, our government, my own government, he said, is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. It is, 
and I'd like you to revisit the call for ceasefire. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Are there any other members of the public online who'd like to speak on this item? No further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to uh, the board and to staff to see if there's any follow-up comments. Sure, I'll just uh, share that the engineer's report is attached and I checked those links this morning and they are working and so the report is there. Okay. And I would also uh, note that within that engineer's report, we do describe general benefit versus special benefit and there is a carve out for general benefit. So that should cover uh, the one comment we received. Thank you. One, uh, Chair, if I may, one other question. So I know uh, if this, we'll, we'll, we'll hear in April whether or not uh, the affected parcel owners have approved uh, the increased assessment. Um, when could we expect any change in level of service if it does pass? Sure. So uh, if it does pass, then uh, then we could go and secure a larger landscape contract. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the timing for that. I'd certainly get back to you and provide a, a schedule, uh, but we would jump right on as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, there's no further questions or comments. I'd like to see if there's a member of the board who'd like to move the staff recommendations. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. So motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor Hernandez. There's no further questions or comments. Uh, I'd like to ask the clerk to call roll call vote. Supervisor Hernandez? Yes. Koenig? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Friend? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That, pass, that item passes unanimously. That will move on to item number eight. This is a public hearing to consider Coastal Commission modifications to sustainability policy and regulatory update of 2022, approved by resolutions 293-2022 and 294-2022 and ordinances 5420-5429, adopt a resolution accepting the commission's modifications, adopt ordinance based on the modifications, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the WCAO Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. With that, I'll, I'll pass this on to Stephanie Hansen, Assistant Director of Planning for a presentation on this item. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Supervisors. <clears throat> Today, we're pleased to present to the board the proposed Coastal Commission modifications to sections of the Sustainability Policy and Regulatory Update, which the board adopted back in December 2022. As the board is aware, portions of the county's general plan and county code also function as the county's local coastal program, or LCP, which requires consistency with the state's Coastal Act. County staff work closely with coastal staff to ensure that the proposed modifications meet the goals of the sustainability update while meeting the intent of the Coastal Act. On December 15, 2023, the Coastal Commission considered portions of the sustainability update that are part of the LCP. Coastal staff recommended 41 modifications to the general plan and county code to address consistency with the Coastal Act and the Coastal Commission certified the amendments with those modifications. The board is requested to accept the modifications by approving the resolution and ordinance in your packet in order for the sustainability update to go into effect countywide. The sustainability update project contained amendments to the general plan and various county code sections the general plan land use and zoning maps and adoption of new design guidelines. The Coastal Commission certification does include the rezoning and redesignation of 10 parcels in the coastal zone as originally approved by the Board of Supervisors. Today, we're only going to focus on their proposed modifications, which are shown as attachment 8D in your packet. The modifications are largely adjustments to existing language that strengthen the clarity an intent of meeting the provisions of the Coastal Act. We'll begin with the general plan. In chapter one, introduction, the modifications include language to strengthen the applicability and interpretation of LCP policies, particularly if there are conflicts which require interpretation. The intent of meeting Coastal Act policies is clarified and a process for consultation with the Coastal Commission's executive director is provided. 
In chapter two, the built environment element, policy BE 2.1.9 is added to the LCP and the policy is modified so that the development may occur below the stated density range when there are conflicts with environmental protection. Policy BE 5.1.1 is reworded to require development in the coastal zone to be consistent with the LCP. In policy BE 5.1.3, the conversion to lower coastal priority uses must meet certain findings. The findings for the conversion of lower cost overnight accommodations include replacement of units or a fee in lieu, the replacement of moderate or high cost accommodation units may be replaced with affordable housing and a selection from a menu of visitor amenities. Policy BE 5.1.7 rewords the policy to protect existing public access during the development of private parcels. Proposed amendments to the access and mobility element are centered around public coastal access. Existing implementation strategies regarding the county's new active transportation plan and regarding parking and bike facilities are added to the LCP. Policy AM 4.1.4, public coastal access points are protected, but the modification acknowledges the need for further clarification with regard to historical access to Twin Lakes Beach via Jeffrey Drive as, a, as may be settled in a future court decision. Jeffrey Drive was included in the table of access points in the 1994 general plan. In policy AM 4.1.5, proposed modifications require that encroachments in the public right-of-way that block public access need to be removed or an application submitted for an encroachment authorization as part of the development process. Modifications to policies AM 6.3.5 and 6.3.6 .6 define conditions for parking restrictions and balance the charging of fees with continued public access and improvements. A new implementation strategy is proposed, which is a reworking of a formal policy addressing funding for maintenance and coastal access enhancement, adding options for funding. In the agriculture, natural resources, and conservation element, an existing definition of agricultural land is added for vineyard lands. And policy ARC 1.1.14, uh, this policy is slightly amend amended to include language from the Coastal Act regarding the nature of unacceptable impacts to agricultural land due to water and sewer line expansion. Modification of existing policy ARC 1.4.6 clarifies the location of proposed residential uses on coastal agricultural lands. One policy regarding leasing laws is removed from the LCP. Modifications to water quality monitoring around Buena Vista and Watsonville landfills in implementation strategy ARC 4.4G are tied to existing board uh, permit requirements. Scenic protection is strengthened. And then this uh, Swanton Road Special Scenic Area, a policy is modified slightly to increase the scenic value <clears throat> to the greatest extent feasible. Modifications to Chapter 7, the Parks and Public Facilities element also address coastal access and funding. Modifications to policy PPF 2.6.1 address continued provision of public access. Policy PPF 2.610, which had been added to address maintenance in the face of climate change has been removed. Um, such considerations will be made in the upcoming uh, safety element uh, uh, amendments um, that uh, consider coastal bluffs and, and beaches <clears throat> at a later date. Implementation strategy PPF 2.6 addresses the need to generate funding for maintenance through a variety of sources while balancing continued fee-free public access. And two definitions were amended to reflect state law. In the county code, five chapters were proposed for modification. In chapter 1310, the zoning regulations, 
a reference to the applicable conversion policy in the general plan is added and findings to meet density bonus law while still meeting LCP requirements has been added. In chapter 1320, which regulates development in the coastal zone, information regarding which uses are appealable to the Coastal Commission has been amended for clarity and principal permitted uses amended slightly for consistency with the Coastal Act. In chapter 1650, which regulates agricultural prote uh, protection, references to conversion policies in the general plan have been added. In Title 18, which regulates land use procedures such as hearings and notices, changes include adding Chapter 1505 on trails and coastal access to the LCP, amending noticing procedures that are for uh, coastal development permits that are consistent with the Coastal Act, clarifying procedures around discretionary approval extensions for coastal development permits, clarifying procedures for minor and major amendments of existing coastal development permits, confirming submittal needs uh, for amending the LCP, and confirming that changes to the general plan policies must be consistent with the environmental resource protections in the Coastal Act, as well as agricultural conversion policies. Finally, a new section 186055 uh, states that in the case of conflicts, the requirements with the LCP and the Coastal Act will guide the resolution. So with that, staff is recommending that the board conduct a public hearing, adopt a resolution accepting the modifications and amending the general plan, approving concept, the ordinance, amending the county code, and direct the clerk of the board to publish the required notice and set second reading for February 13th, 2024. Staff is happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Um, are there any board members that have questions on this item? Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, this, this has been a long time coming, but of course, in reviewing all of the changes there, it's a reminder just how extensive uh, these updates were on our part. And uh, I suppose the Coastal Commission could be forgiven for, for taking a year uh, to review it and uh, ultimately making these suggestions. Um, just to clarify the process going forward, I believe if we approve these changes or approve the suggestions without changes, then it has to go back to the Coastal Commission for a final uh, stamp of approval before yeah. it can actually go into effect. Is yeah. that right? It's, it's a long process, but yes, it goes back um, to the Coastal Commission one more time for it. It's a minor report to the uh, commission that the modifications were accepted. And that would happen at their next meeting um, in mid-March. Got it. And then at that point, it would start the 30 day period before it goes into implementation. I'll, I'll rely on, on council, but 30 day period would start after adoption. And so they'll be pretty well aligned. The whole thing would go into effect just after mid March. Got it. It'll go, it'll go into effect either 30 days after second reading or upon approval by the Coastal Commission, whichever happens later. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, just might uh, want to make a comment. Yeah, first of all, thank you uh, for our county staff, especially Stephanie Hansen, who just made this presentation. Uh, it's been a long haul, as, as what's been said. And I want to thank uh, Supervisor Cummings for serving on the Coastal Commission. That's one of the most time consuming uh, commission appointments that we have in the county. And I'm, I'm relieved we're finally getting to this point and uh, it's been done over a year that we've been after this uh, and the the regulations, the modifications to our general plan and the, co uh, the codes and the procedures overall. And although I'm grateful to the Coastal Commission for working diligently with the county, and I have talked to them, uh, some uh, directors face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, to finalize these updates, I can continue to be very concerned about the future of our transportation projects within the coastal zone of Santa Cruz County, especially the likely feasibility of passenger rail within the coastal zone. I've expressed this on the Regional Transportation Commission uh, uh, in meetings, um, there are some real significant barriers to doing that, and especially with the bridges and trestles that we have. And I know that the Coastal Commission is, um, staff has made it clear they preferred what they call a managed retreat for all infrastructure 
affected by sea level rise, uh, but retreating, uh, retreating this uh, cur current rail corridor line will be incredibly, I think, cost prohibitive and present environmental and engineering challenges uh, that will be really difficult to overcome. And um, I really thank you for getting this to us. I can't wait till we can find out the impact all of this is gonna have on the proposed rail trail line. Thank you. Thank you. So any other comments from supervisors or questions for staff? Supervisor Koenig. I'll just make one other comment, which is, uh, you know, in case anyone has forgotten, I, I do uh, think that these, this entire sustainability update will really have um, a beneficial and transformative effect for our county. I know a lot of folks who are excited about some of the provisions um, that enhance our agro uh, agritourism businesses throughout the community, um, as well as the opportunities for infill development and more affordable housing. So this is a really important package of changes. And thank you to Ms. Hansen uh, and all the staff that have worked on this. It has been a long haul and we are almost there. All right. Hearing all the comments or questions coming from the board, I'd like to um, open the public hearing and invite members of the public to come and speak on this item. Um, so if you are here in the audience um, physically, if you can step up and line up in front of the podium, uh, you'll be given two minutes. And if you are online, you will also be given two minutes once we close public comment here in person. So please step to the podium. Yes, good morning, David Schwartz, candidate for District 2. Supervisor, um, I, I noticed on the uh, recommendations that the first line item was a public hearing. And I'm not sure if that's happened or not. Uh, you wouldn't think it'd be in the recommendations if it had. So if that is a recommendation, um, I'd make a recommendation that we not agree to this because I think we should hear it from the public first. And I know this has been going on for some time and I'm an advocate for getting things done sooner rather than later. But I think the public needs to have that input. And I believe that it is in our best interest to have that public hearing. Now, I noticed that you're scheduling, though. Uh, this is going back to the commission uh, in February, uh, like February 13th or something, as I believe it said. Now, that's less than two weeks away. I don't know how you can have a public hearing in two weeks. I mean, my schedule is pretty full. I probably wouldn't be able to make it. Uh, so it. it, it presents a challenge. That's why I would suggest that you not move ahead with this right now. Let's move on to those recommendations, maybe accept some of them like having the public hearing and let's get that public hearing done first and listen to the web, what the public says about these changes. Thank you very much. And, and Chair, just to clarify, I believe that this is the public hearing and that's why we're taking public comments. That is correct. <laughs> Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. It's my understanding if anybody is going to question anything going on here for a future litigation, now is the time or forever hold your peace, I suppose. So I'm going to question everything in here, just like I'd like to question probably the 150,000 pages that have been rubber stamped by you guys that are like helium balloons being controlled. How have citizens become so meek and uneducated? Jeez, we can really thank UCSC. This is a quote from Stalin. But this really has to do with the Agenda 2021-2030 that came in long before 1968, came into this county through the SEEDS project in 1993 and was adopted into, adopted into protocol in 1997. I've never been in a city that has worse traffic than Santa Cruz, and that's all by your guys' design. So by Stalin... Stalin once ripped the feathers out of a live chicken as a lesson to his followers. He then set the chicken on the floor a short distance away. The chicken was bloodied and suffering immensely. Yet when Stalin began to toss some bits of wheat towards the chicken, it followed him around. He said to his followers, this is how easy it is to govern stupid people. They will follow you no matter how much pain you cause them, as long as you throw them a worthless little treat once in a while. You guys, this, our country and the world is being run by Fabian socialists. And there's one teaching at UC Santa Cruz right now named Ryan Coonerty. This is a quote from Brock Chisholm, who was uh, the first inspector general from 1948 to 1953. 
To achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individuality, their loyalty to family traditions, and their national identity. So I'm questioning all the stuff that you guys are going to rubber stamp. Thank you. And I just want to remind members of the public, the item that we're discussing is a Coastal Commission modifications to the sustainability plan. I want to encourage members of the public to be respectful and keep the comments that you're going to make related to this item. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rhonda. Manu, this question goes to you. I'm very confused. You looked all starry-eyed about this um, affordable housing. However, many of us who are looking at the alleged affordable housing do not consider it affordable at all when there are all these little sardine cans being put together that cost well over $3,000 a month. So that's not affordable and it sounds very disingenuous and the cramming and cramming and cramming and going up to the sky and turning Santa Cruz into something that is the complete opposite of preserving our coastal nature doesn't make any sense to me. So please explain what you call affordable housing because affordable would be like $900 a month realistically, when you look at the de demographics of people who are living here and people who are being imported here. And yet we've got wealthy people showing up and being able to pay for the higher expenses of three, 4,000, 5,000. You look at um, some of these homes are going for $10,000 a month in rent. That's not affordable. So can you please explain to me what you call affordable? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to us who's here in chambers? Okay, after the gentleman in the black shirt, we're going to close public comment here in chambers. We're going to move to public comment that's online. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I have a question about um, the slide that referenced uh, policy BE, built environment is what that stands for, 2.1.9 that um, the densities would be allowed to be below the prescribed density within uh, when there are conflicting issues with environmental protection. So I have two questions about that. How is that defined in terms of um, environmental uh, conflict? Is it water? Is it uh, endangered species? And is that determined by a developer who would pay to have an environmental analysis that suits um, their whim, as often as it goes? So I, I would like to know what the clarification, I would like clarification on what the definition of environmental harm could be that would cause uh, densities to be below. And if any of that would apply in the pleasure point area, as well as uh, in the Twin Lakes Beach and the uh, Santa Cruz Harbor area, the former redevelopment land. I have a question about, um, it requires encroachment of development at, at access points to be removed. I was pretty shocked to read in the paper that the Coastal Commission set aside the judicial opinion of Judge Volkman of Santa Cruz County Superior Court regarding the Beach Drive neighborhood uh, issue. And um, I also wonder if this means that the private, the gate that has for many years restricted access to private's beach in Capitola, will that all be taken down now? I hope so. Um, I am happy to hear that there will be increased water monitoring around Buena Vista dump. Will that also happen at Gimeo? And uh, it needs to consider uh, ag runoff. I, I'm concerned about issues Thank not being appealable. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrunner. I think any, any further questions, if you can send, if you can. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Tim Delaney. I've been here before. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, this, uh, the general plan update and all that sort of stuff that you guys are talking about. In the Tahoe Basin, uh, it's an epic disaster. You know, so they, they want to update the general plan and they, they've been going through all that sort of stuff. And they're all talking about affordable housing and access and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, 72 miles of rim 
And those folks can't keep their hands off of a single inch of land around the entire lake. So now bald eagles and golden eagles and sacred Native American land is threatened. And affordable housing, huh, that is an absolute joke. That's just a giveaway to developers. That's all that is. And again, just like these other folks are pointing out to you, they're just cramming people in there uh, to the detriment of uh, the environment and quality of life for everybody there. Y you can't even get on the road to go skiing over at Palisades. The roads are all log jammed and, and, uh, and annihilated. So life is just not very fun on the beach. Elbow to elbow, you know, that's no good for locals or tourists. And so, you know, I think you really need to think about all that in regards to this. Also for elderly people, I want to let you know that all this time spent here <laughs> and no one cares about elderly people and these corporations, these healthcare corporations and what they're going to be doing to them. So it's a lot of time, a lot of money wasted and elderly people being thrown under the bus and no one cares about U.S. federal law and how these corporations are treating them. And they think they're above the law, just like Donald Trump. So, you know, it's a lot to think about. I appreciate the Stalin comment. I wish I could say more here, but I think you folks should hold off. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, you very much. Monday. All right, we'll close public comment here in person and then we'll turn it over to the clerk for members of the public who are wanting to comment online. Thank you, Chair. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, uh, I appreciate the previous speaker uh, giving the definition of affordable housing giveaway to developers. It is not affordable to people. I've lived in the county since uh, 81. And over the years, I've seen the degradation of, of the coastal area. It's, it's very, very disturbing. And, and the Coastal Commission role, in, as well as the county, in, in that degradation, it seems to me the Coastal Commission is protecting corporate interests. And some examples of this, and when I'm done with my comments, I'd like Supervisor Cummings to please announce the details of the upcoming Coastal Commission meeting, because she sit on the Coastal Commission. Um, the, uh, the installation and approval by the Corp uh, Coastal Commission of 4G Verizon antennas all up and down the coast. This is definitely detrimental to the environment radiation emitting antennas that, uh, that kill birds and bees and harm our health. And you can look at cellphonetaskforce.org. That is not sustainable. That is not protecting the environment. And I have a question. You referred to active transportation plant. My understanding is this has to do with radar uh, detection. I would like elaboration on that. It is extremely hazardous. So those are my comments. It should be uh, delayed, I think, and until um, after the Coastal Commission meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. Uh, with that being said, we'll close the public hearing and I'll bring it back to staff for any comments on questions that were raised during the public comment period. Oh, certainly. <clears throat> uh, with regards to public input, um, I, I'd like to just remind everybody this is a a 10 year old process. It, it's the culmination of several projects that had public input over time. Um, once we were able to gather all the amendments together, we had 23 uh, public meetings, including um, meetings here at the board, the Planning Commission, the Agricultural Policy Advisory Commission. Um, <clears throat> and so there's been uh, no 
uh, no shortage of uh, opportunities for public input on this process. Um, <clears throat> I know there were questions about affordable housing, the sustainability update. Uh, we didn't talk much about all the great things it does for our urban standards to help increase opportunities for housing, but that was the main point of these um, of these am amendments. Um, with regard to uh, built environment policy 2.1.9, um, what kind of environment um, that would be as defined by Title 16 of the county code. Um, staff is involved in that evaluation. It would not affect the gate on Beach Drive. Um, and appeals uh, have a process uh, for CDPs. Um, and it does involve the Coastal Commission. So we really um, are not about to change or have the ability to change that, that process. Um, and lastly, <clears throat> with regard to the active transportation plan, that's a bicycle and pedestrian plan that the board adopted last year it has nothing to do with monitoring or radiation or anything like that. Um, otherwise, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'll just just to comment on something that was raised. One of the members of the public was interested in learning about the next Coastal Commission meeting. I'll just say you can go to coastal.ca.gov to find our agendas if anybody's interested in that. But I will say that um, we also had this on our agenda during our December Coastal Commission meeting, which was here locally in Santa Cruz and provided members of the opportunity to comment on this. So um, just want to highlight how much public input there was and opportunities for public input, which I think is really great to have during the planning process on some of these plans that have great significance to our community. Um, so I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any other questions or comments. Seeing none, I just had one question. Um, and it's more of a comment, but uh, the under built environment, um, there's one section which discusses how it requires any conversion of visitors serving overnight accommodations to a residential use to be 100% affordable and provide visitors serving benefits, amenities, or equivalent units. Um, I just, I'm just curious how that might intersect with our um, short-term rental policies because you know there's a number. One of the things that's been a big issue is the conversion of housing to short-term rentals which can serve as low cost accommodations or just overnight accommodations in the coastal zone. And if we want, if there was an effort to try to, you know, restrict those uses or kind of dial that back, given the housing crisis, would this then prevent us from converting some of those units back to housing if it's not affordable or how would this intersect with that kind of policy? Yeah, it's, it's kind of um, two sides of the coin, if you will, that, the Coastal Act contains uh, priorities, and honestly, housing isn't really one of them. It's a it's a fairly low priority in the in the Coastal Act. Um, so, <clears throat> when we're talking about existing uh, motels and hotels that have low rates, um, the Coastal Act is very um, strong in protecting those so that everybody can have access uh, to our beautiful coast. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have private property owners who are renting their properties and they're kind of two uh, issues of the same problem, but one is really about housing. The other one is about low cost accommodation and, and for visitors, you know, visiting the, the coast. So there's a bit of overlap, but they don't really uh, affect each other, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. And, and I will just note for the public that there there used to be a mandate of the Coastal Commission for affordable housing in the coastal zone, and that was stripped by the state legislature back in the 80s. And we're still trying to actually fight to get that provision put back into the Coastal Act. But just wanted to clarify that. And, and, then, and then I just want to thank staff for all their hard work on this. It's been a, a long time coming. We'll see how it all develops over time. Um, but I'm really glad to see that we're making progress on this and I'm, the Coastal Commission didn't have any issues when it, when it came to us in December. And so I'm pretty confident that when it goes back to the Coastal Commission that we'll be able to move through this uh, pretty seamlessly. So thank you all for your work. And with that, I'll look to see if there's a motion uh, on this item. I'll move the recommended actions. A motion by Supervisor Koenig, seconded by Supervisor McPherson. 
I'll turn it over to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Hernandez? Aye. Koenig? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Friend? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That item passes unanimously. So we have a time certain item at 1045. And since we've got about five minutes, let's just take a five minute break and we'll reconvene at 1045 for the next item on our agenda. All right, everyone, um, welcome back. The next item on our agenda is item number 11. This is a time certain item. The Board of Supervisors shall recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5 to convene and carry out a regularly scheduled meeting. And with that, I'll turn it over to the chair of that board, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you. I will now officially call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Directors Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Director McPherson? Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Here. Friend? Here. Balboni? Here. Director Brown is absent. And Chair Koenig? Here. Great. We have a quorum. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? None today. <laughs> None today. Thank you. Are there any oral communications for the Zone 5 Flood Control Board? Okay, seeing none, I'll move on to item four, which is sure. approval. Yeah. My, my oh, apologies, sorry. Chair. We, we do have a speaker Comments? online. Yes. All right, great. Go ahead. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, again, I request that you call for a halt to geoengineering weather intervention operations, which are causing increase in severe floods and drought. This is in your area of jurisdiction about the flood zone. And I refer you to geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington. We need to be looking at what are some of the causes of this um, disastrous, chaotic weather conditions. And it's more than just fossil fuels. And you can hear Dane Wigington on KSCO 1080 Saturday. This is local uh, morning at 8 a.m. and repeated at 6 a.m. And he says that the climate engineering is a planetary death sentence. There's no limit to the deception and denial. And he quotes patents for what they're doing. This is in the record. There's also a video they have called the dimming. You can see on geoengineeringwatch.org, um, drought deluge scenario is a hallmark of geoengineering. We are in very deep trouble. Um, I urge you to address this issue and call for a halt to these weather intervention operations, which harm Santa Cruz County and the Thank world. you, Ms. Garrett. Move. Is there anyone else? Online. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I do see a member of the public here in chambers who wishes to address us. Thank you very much. My name is Becky Steinbruner. Um, I want to point out in the uh, action summary minutes of your December 12th, 2023 meeting, there is no information provided at all regarding uh, what members of the public uh, stated to you at that meeting. This meeting, I believe, is not available in recording on a website anywhere. So how does the public learn what other members of the public have taken time to come and, and uh, testify before you about? I'd like that corrected in some way for public transparency and for uh, public information. Um, I also want to, uh, again, ask that your commission look into um, 
having Dr. Helen Dalkey from UC Davis come and uh, have a, a public town hall meeting or webinar, something about the value of uh, agricultural uh, and stormwater re uh, percolation. That's not there. Virtually no product, no projects like that happening in this area when there is opportunity for it to happen, especially in the uh, land that SoCal Creek Water District owns up on Glenwood, 200 acres they own. So um, to that end, please uh, explore that, bring that to the public, educate the public about Dr. Dalkey's work, educate yourselves and help it uh, form policy that can benefit our area using stormwater to help recharge the, the aquifer. It could be happening in the freeway interchanges that are under construction now, small recharge projects, funneling uh, stormwater from the freeway into those areas. And finally, I urge you to protest SoCal Creek Water District rate changes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbarner. Yes, sir. If you have a comment for the flood control district, go ahead. Comment, um, and then I'll uh, get out of here real quick. I'm thinking about this, all these things in context at a local, state, and federal level. I always hear affordable housing. Uh, folks want to pay off everyone's student loans and whatnot. And uh, meanwhile, you know, I'm the guardian of my mother, Marianne, in Nevada. And what I'm finding here is that uh, there's not a lot of interest in uh, holding up the pillars of our healthcare system and Social Security and Medicare for elderly people. So I'm looking at all this, you know, I'm in my late 50s here and a younger generation here in their 30s and 40s wants a whole lot of stuff and they're bleeding our society. They're bleeding our healthcare you know, system and are bleeding, they're bleeding our military and they're sucking all this money and time out for affordable housing and student lane, you know, loan payoffs. So sure, how does this connect to the zone five? Well, like control it district? connects to all of you folks because I hear the group think lingo over and over again, affordable housing, student loan payoffs. Everyone's complaining about money. And meanwhile, no one cares about my mother. And everyone's perfectly happy with leveraging off of me in life. And I hate it. I can't stand it anymore. Okay. I don't want her civil rights violated by a corporation or society. It really stinks that when I'm a guardian and I go to a bank or any institution in this country and they provide me resistance and it doesn't matter whether it's guardian POA or trust. So all this time that you're, you're spending here, is sucking the life out of us 50, 60, and 70-year-olds that have a lot of responsibility. And I, I would hope that everyone start thinking about that a little bit, okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You folks have a fine day. All right. Uh, so anyone else who wishes to address the Flood Control District Board, we'll uh, move on to item four, approval of meeting minutes. And uh, are there any comments or questions by members of the board? Who they be approved? Second. Okay, we have a motion by Director McPherson, a second by Director Cummings to approve the December 12th minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Or, aye. Actually, do we have to do a roll call vote since Supervisor Friend is online? Right. Sorry about that. Uh, Clerk, if you could please call the roll. No problem. Uh, Director Hernandez. Yes. Alboni. Yes. McPherson. Aye. Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. And friend? Aye. All right, that motion passes unanimously. We'll proceed with the regular agenda, item five, to approve and accept the draft zone five drainage master plan, which updates and expands upon previous master plans for this zone, and direct district staff to work with County Public Works, the city of Capitola, Schaefe and Wheeler Consulting Engineers, and their subconsultants to complete stormwater fee study, including completing an election following the Proposition 218 proceedings to support and finalize the draft zone five drainage master plan as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. And for, for on this item, we have our district engineer. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Director Mashad. Thank you, Chairman and Directors. Matt Mashad, your district engineer. Uh, the item before you is our draft 
Zone 5 Drainage Master Plan update. And with me today uh, is Dan Schaaf. He is our consultant on this effort. I do want to give a little history on this uh, effort. This contract was actually approved in June of 2020. And uh, it's been a long time coming to get here. Uh, we had COVID. We were in the heat of COVID in June of 2020. So it slowed us quite a bit. And then we had a massive fire that fall, which slowed us even more. But here we are uh, with a master plan for your consideration. Uh, Dan will be giving a PowerPoint presentation summarizing this report. Uh, this contract was to provide the, the district and the city of Capitola um, not just a master plan, but a, a CIP, you know, so that we could understand the operations and management and capital needs of, of our zone five area. And so we're excited to bring it to you today. Uh, this will also lead to a Prop 218 ballot proceedings, which we plan to undertake this spring into summer and uh, trying to conclude uh, this calendar year and to see the, the will of the people. So with that, I will turn the microphone over to Dan and uh, he'll give you a presentation on the on the report. All right, good morning. Uh, Dan Schaff with Schaff & Wheeler. Uh, a little bit about what we'll talk about today. Uh, who did the work? Uh, what our goals were for with this project? How we got the project done? What we found out? Uh, what we recommend? And where do we go from here? So the team uh, really starts with the county and city staff. So both the county uh, public work staff and the city of Capitola uh, public work staff. Um, as my firm, Schaff & Wheeler, we handled the project management of this, the hydrology and hydraulics, which is uh, my forte. And we also developed any uh, improvements that needed to be done. So we figure out the cost and the priority of those. Uh, we also had the firm of NCE, which really specializes in operations plans. So they work very closely with the city and county staff, uh, operations staff to uh, figure out ways to optimize the systems. And also a funding strategy uh, is one of their other uh, tasks on this. And with them is NBS, uh, who are what I like to call financial engineers. They really get into the nuts and bolts of finance. And lastly, Presidio Systems, they uh, specialize in condition assessment. So they actually have CCTV robots that look through the pipes and figure out how things are operating. Uh, so what was our goal? Our goal was really to create a holistic study of the Zone 5 system, including the city of Capitola. Uh, Schaff and Wheeler studied Zone 5 and Zone 6 back in 2013, but uh, the city of Capitola didn't participate in that. Uh, we want to make recommendations for improving the system to increase capacity so that People don't see uh, as much damage or life safety issues from large storm events, uh, both in pipes and in the uh, streams and culverts that uh, supply flood protection to the zone five. And we also want to look at the system itself, what condition it is, what condition it's in, and what can be improved. Uh, on the operations, this happens every year, no matter what the storm conditions are, is, is there a better way to maintain these systems, a more efficient way? a uh, better way of reporting and figuring out really what's being done uh, because there's a lot being done. Um, and then can we optimize that and get the most out of the current equipment and labor? And then that all leads into a funding strategy. How do we pay for all this? So on the engineering, the hydraulics side of things is what really uh, my firm focused on. Uh, we start out with the data we used in 2013. There's been a lot of great data collection by both the county and the city. And we updated all our hydraulic models to really look at uh, what, what really are the current conditions. We also looked at uh, storm patterns and what's changed in the last 10 years. And there's some great stream gauges that we use, like the one on Soquel Creek. Uh, we looked at both the 25 and 100 year storms and what their impacts are on those systems. We spent a lot of time in the field and unfortunately some of it during the height of COVID, which didn't make things too easy. Um, and we also, so we spent a lot of time just documenting things, figuring things out. Uh, then uh, Presidio Systems spent a lot of time underground, really looking at what condition are pipes in? Are they falling apart? Or are they full of sediment, garbage, those type of things and provided rankings for all those so that we can really look at what needs to be repaired. Uh, NC spent, numerous days, hours, time with the operation staff of both uh, Capitola and the county to figure out how do they operate? What do they spend money on? And is there, how can that be improved? So that, that was a lot of time. Um, and then on the funding, uh, 
uh, both MVS and NCE really looked at how are things funded right now? How do things, uh, how does the money flow through the system? And um, they also started some initial polling of people to see what, you know, what the level of interest is in uh, funding stormwater and flood control improvements. So my results, what I would do. So our hydraulic model really focused on what we call um, the main pipes, the um, regional system. So in our 2013 study, we looked at all the smaller pipe system and our new study works really in concert. So the two work together, um, but we looked at 25 year in all the pipes to see where there was capacity restrictions and, and how bad those restrictions were. And then in the channels and the bridges and the culverts, we looked at a hundred year. So similar to what a FEMA study would be. Um, we looked at the cost of improving those to bring everything up to those two levels of service. Um, we prioritized those based on uh, known issues, uh, public concern, uh, life safety concerns, property damage concerns. So that a lot of that went into that and then cost. Uh, we also did look at climate adaptation. So uh, we looked at both sea level rise in the lower areas that are subject to uh, tidal impacts. And then we also look at precipitation changes because we've noted that there's changes in a persist, uh, precipitation patterns and amounts uh, as we move forward. And so we've used the best available science to uh, make sure that these improvements work with those predictions. Uh, so within the system, we noticed, noted about $19 million in total county uh, improvements needed in the system in about 13, called 14 in the city of Capitola. And we prioritize those based on high, moderate, and low um, priorities based on what I talked about earlier. And then again, we looked at those along with climate changes. On the condition side, uh, we looked at, we walked a lot of the creeks, bridges, culverts, and then uh, like I mentioned, MBS, uh, Presidio Systems, spent a lot of time uh, with their robotic CCTV cameras looking through pipes. You can see here, some are very clean and well-maintained and some places, uh, and this is very typical of almost every community that we do, this is uh, corrugated metal pipe starts to deteriorate over time. And you know that potentially needs to be repaired. It can be either replaced or um, repaired in on site with uh, cured in place or spiral wind, uh, wound pipe, other repair options. So we looked, so about four and a half million dollars in noted condition. On the operation side, this is what uh, NCE really focused on. And this is a big component of the system is keeping what there is now maintained and operating correctly. Uh, they noted about $2 million, $2.1 million annually needed to operate the system and another million dollars in MPDS, MPDS which is the clean water program to keep uh, the storm drain functioning and to make sure that the water that's discharged meets the standard. Uh, and really some four really important points of their approach. And I really like these is that uh, the focus is on uh, proactive data-driven O&M. So really looking at being proactive, not just responding to emergencies and looking at the data, what is that telling us? Um, it's uh, focusing resources on areas and assets with the greatest needs or return on investment. So, you know, most bang for the buck because, you know, not everything can always be funded. Um, this does require more resources from what's being spent currently. Um, but we want the new uh, system program to be efficient, repeatable, and predictive so that, again, it's proactive is the main so when we look at the financial analysis that was done by NCE and uh, MBS, it's that right now about a million dollars is being spent on O&M in zone five, about 10 million, uh, 100 million, 100,000 uh, come in from development impacts. And mm -hmm. we know that noted that uh, roads do fund some of the maintenance of uh, the system. There's numerous ways to fund um, stormwater systems. Uh, and here's a list of potentials, uh, you know, from impact fees, general fund, taxes, uh, parcel related fees, special assessments. Um, and then also uh, this comes up quite a bit is, you know, we want to make projects that are appealing to grants to get others outside to help. Are there partnerships potentially with uh, agencies like Caltrans, you know, within their right of way? Are there pro projects that could benefit, be a dual benefit? So things like that. 
on the capacity recommendations, we identified the projects again to bring everything up to that level of service. And these are phased based on their priority. Um, we from here we would study alternatives. Are there better ways to do this? Could they potentially uh, work with another, maybe a sewer project? You're tearing up the road. It's a good time to uh, maybe add new stormwater piping. So there's lots of alternatives. We want to kind of kind of tighten up the numbers on all these and look at opportunities to work with others uh, on the condition side. Um, the need to address immediate, like if we notice blockage in a pipe, you know, the O&M staff would know about that and th these need to be acted on uh, quickly and uh, top priority. Um, but there are alternatives. If, if a particular pipe is continually uh, being blocked with sediment or the corrugated metal pipe is falling apart, are there alternatives, a new route, a better way to uh, improve that system? On the operation side, uh, this, this is probably where the largest change will be. And so definitely need to take a phased approach, not going to change the system overnight. It has to work with the current staff. They need to be trained on the new system. And, you know, a lot of this is procedural. So it's going to take time and it's going to need, it's a feedback loop. You know, they may have better ideas how to make it better. So it's one of those systems that's as money and time allow, it's just going to get better and better. Um, the one recommendation was to purchase a program called Lucidity. It's a reporting and documenting program. I think a lot of uh, public works uh, operations groups use that. Uh, again, the reporting is going to be really beneficial with a program like that. So we can see where the money's being spent, how much and how to make it better. On the funding, um, the funding really starts here with the county and city staff um, to figure out what are the best mechanisms to fund what we're talking about today. Um, the public needs to be involved. There needs to be outreach. They need to understand what these projects are, what they're costing and why they're being done. Um, typically, it's nice to identify the key stakeholders, the people who are going to benefit the most, maybe pay the most or have the most interest in these projects, uh, because a lot of times they can become champions of these things. Uh, you know, and a lot of times uh, it's the messenger. So um, if civic groups tell you about a program, sometimes it's better than um, the government in itself. Uh, but again, more polling, figuring out what works best. Um, and like Matt mentioned that uh, there is a 218 process if it goes towards uh, that type of funding and uh, that needs to start sooner than later. So real quickly, I'll wrap this up. Uh, next steps is on the engineering side, we look at alternatives, ways to save money, ways to make things multi-beneficial. Um, to monitor the system every winter, collect data, see how the system's performing, uh, make the easy changes to the O&M program, things that don't cost money that can actually benefit uh, on the current spending, um, develop a funding strategy, how will all these things be paid for or what portions will be paid for. Uh, and on my side, we like when it gets to, when it gets funded, when it gets into engineering design and everybody likes when it gets constructed. And that is what I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I just want to add the uh, recommended actions today are approve and accept the draft zone five drainage master plan, which updates and expand, expands upon previous master plans for the zone and direct district staff to work with County Public Works, City Capitola, consulting engineers and their sub consultants to complete the stormwater fee study, including completing an election following the Prop 218 proceedings to support and finalize the draft Zone five drainage master plan. And lastly, to let the board know that we are planning to give a similar presentation to the city of Capitola on February 22nd. And with that, we can answer any questions you may have. Thank you, District Engineer Machado. Thank you, Mr. Schaff. Are there questions from board members? All right, well, uh, I've got a couple, given that this is actually pretty much the entire urban area of the first district that we're talking about here. Um, the first is, um, you know, there was sort of a lot of interest in the fact that this master planning process was happening after the 2023 floods, and we saw particularly the impact uh, in SoCal Village and Capitola Village. Um, I was just, but I didn't really see too much discussion of those flooding issues within this report. Um, I given the, I understand that there's quite a bit of infrastructure to look at, but um, I'm just curious why 
um, that wasn't addressed at all. All right, take that on. So uh, SoCal Village is addressed in our draft report. Um, it is probably the one uh, sort of Achilles heel. It's a known issue. It happens often. Uh, we looked at various alternatives there. Um, they are very costly. And it's a big chunk of that overall expense that's in that $19 million. Um, and it does need to be studied. And that is one that absolutely could be attractive to grant funding because you potentially could need some outside sources to to make that happen. So that that is a known. And then on the coastal side at, at Capitola as well, um, you know, the known problems were addressed in the master plan. We did not, I need to correct, we did not address or study uh, coastal flooding, so wave action uh, damages. We're really focused on the riverine system, but they do interact and we take those into consideration when we're looking at the channels and the pipes. Okay. I, if I could add yeah. a little bit to that, we were also really focused on the infrastructure that the community built. And so, you know, whether that was the pipe systems or open channels that were developed over many, many decades. And so our, our focus was there, not, not just uh, the creeks and rivers, um, trying to maintain what we've built many, many decades ago. I understand that there's a, a extensive network out there as the maps demonstrate. Um, so just to follow up uh, on what you're saying, Mr. Uh, Schaaf, uh, 37 to 63 million was the estimated costs, uh, I think, in the report. That's a pretty big range. Is that upper end of that, considering some of the SoCal Greek projects, or is that, you know, kind of over and above? And can you just give a little bit more description of what projects you, you did look at that were uh, so costly? Um, so the, the range is due to alternatives, uh, mostly in, on the kind of between 34th and 38th Avenue. There's a lot of uh, existing systems through uh, mobile home parks and uh, alternatives there were to look at bypassing those. Uh, so that, that provides a range. Some are more expensive. Uh, more analysis needs to be done. Uh, on the uh, SoCal Village, um, I, if potentially if Justin, who worked with me, is on the line, he could probably answer exactly where the funding and the difference in cost to those individual projects are. But um, we did look at an estimate for uh, improvements there and alternatives to uh, that improvement. And basically, it comes to almost like a flood wall levy type scenario. Mm -hmm. But then you also have to protect the areas behind those walls. So there, those costs add up very quickly. Got it. And so will the next phase um, where you should start conducting some public outreach, get a sense of public's appetite for kind of this range of projects? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And so we'll be crafting that next and and uh, reporting back to the to the board. And uh, yes, get the, the pulse of the people and see what what has the most traction. Absolutely. And so you anticipate doing that in the coming months? And then, I mean, it sounds like ultimately holding a Prop 218 election this year. That is correct. We hope to bring uh, an item back to this board uh, this spring, summer for, uh, for a fall consideration of Prop 218 ballots. And then uh, the conclusion of that would affect the following year uh, assessments. Okay. Uh, any general sense of what kind of a, an assessment we're talking about? I mean, how many parcels are in the area and, and what it would take to finance 37 to 63 million? I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Uh, nor do I, but that is exactly what the MBS is doing. And they do know those numbers. And I don't know if Sarah is on the line. I know she was traveling today, um, but she could tell you exactly the number of parcels. And and it's a range. It's, and it, again, I think it's, these things become iterative. The more I understand about them is it's what does it cost versus what are people willing to spend? What can you do with, you know, it, it kind of, it's a feedback loop and there's some sweet spot there. Right. And that's finding that sweet spot is I think the name, name of the game. I would add that, um, and this is an important piece. So today we call it a draft master plan and we really need to understand the finance abilities and the community support. And with the knowledge of that, we will put that into the report and then call it a final. It doesn't make sense to have a final that's unfunded. We only want a final that's fundable based upon community support. So, so the word draft will stay here until we get input from the community and we have a fundable program and we'll adjust as needed 
and then finalize it as a funded program, not just a program that will never be funded. Right. We'll look forward to the next phase of the public outreach phase of this and, and hearing more about the details uh, behind finances and would be happy to attend um, some of those meetings. You know, uh, fortunately, I think out of sight, out of mind, this infrastructure is incredibly important, but uh, I think a lot of members of the public probably weren't planning on investing in their stormwater systems this year. So should be some interesting conversations. Uh, thank you for the draft report. Welcome. Okay. Uh, could I have a question? Supervisor um, McPherson. We we're looking at another atmospheric river coming here, and I don't know how many inches, but um, in your most vulnerable places, uh, at what point is it two inches of rain that it's really creates a huge problem today, or is it four? Or do you have any kind of a criteria to see? I'm just trying to think of how serious the storm has to be before we're in a flooding crisis of right. some part. That's a good question. Dan, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, so a little kind of peek behind the curtain, but. Um, if you've noticed that sometimes it doesn't rain a lot and we get a lot of runoff, right? If the ground is saturated, if it's been raining days prior, it doesn't take a lot of rain to create issues and vice versa. If it's been dry for weeks or months and you get a large storm, sometimes just the creeks don't fill up. And so it, we, so we really focus on what creates uh, the event in the pipe in the Creek. And that can be from a wide range of different rainfalls, but typically the size of the watershed or the basin dictates the amount or the duration of the storm. So if you have a, you know, the Sacramento River takes days for that to get to the uh, the bay, you're interested in larger storms, longer storms. But here in an urbanized area, a quick one hour storm with a large burst of rainfall in five to 15 minutes can really cause some issues because the pipes, the inlets aren't designed for that. So it's really hard to answer that. But uh, with the change, with us now being far more aware of atmospheric rivers and what they do and how they come in, that they do create much different storm patterns. And that's what the climate change adaptation that we looked at is doing is, you know, it, it, no two storms are the same. So we need to be ready for that. Thank you, Dr. McPherson. Dr. Friend, did you have a question? It was less of a question, more of a comment on just the fact that I appreciate that because this is pretty long overdue, the investments in the system. We've had historic challenges within the system, within the zone. It's not the only zone that we've had these challenges. I mean, I think that all of us have uh, inadequate infrastructure and drainage systems throughout our districts, but I just appreciate that the master plan is leading toward, I think, a, a more um, informed future for this area moving forward. So thank you. It was just appreciation for uh, the staff's work on this. Thank you for your comments. I'll open it for public comment. Anyone here in chambers wish to address us on the draft zone five drainage master plan? Yes, I have questions. Dan, you said, you know, you were interested in the will of the people. And I'm really glad you said such a thing because as I've witnessed in this room over a year, the will of the people is constantly being ignored. And I have a lot of questions about election integrity. When I was a child, the election was one day with the results being released that night. In our last election, it lasted a month and the results weren't provided for three weeks. So um, I call BS. I'm really concerned about our election integrity. I don't feel like there's secure. So um, I do hear what Marilyn Garrig is saying. I've looked into HARP weather weapons. Those actually do exist. I've looked at Dane Wigington's website. I can go outside. I can see when the chemtrailing um, is happening and how it affects our weather. And no one up here is addressing weather weapon technology. I've been really interested in these sudden atmospheric river storms. I've lived here my entire life. I've never seen anything like this. I did go through the storm of 80 and um, what's happening now seems to be unprecedented and I am convinced that it's by intention. What I want to know is who's making the money off of these projects? Where are these millions of dollars numbers coming from? I would like to see that. Who are the companies and are there any inappropriate relationships with any members of the board? Um, I would be really interested to see how that money is, is coming about and um, be specific on that and if there's any relationships with any board members. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, I'll speak one more time before I run off. I couldn't help myself. Um, I, I like this sort of stuff. I see uh, this as being more of a need than a want, like my concerns with regards to affordable housing and so on. And my, I always like the contrast things with up in Tahoe. They were all wrapped around the affordable housing bandwagon and whatnot. And meanwhile, they leave a lead cable in the lake. What's up with that? It's their environment and it's their business model. And you leave that huge AT&T cable in there leaching lead in their water supply. How does that help the people of Tahoe? So same thing down here. You know, I look at these type of infrastructure sorts of things with uh, water systems and drainage and everything and protecting your water quality and whatnot. That's a need. Just like my home, I had to replace all kinds of huge drain pipes, you know, to move water away from my home and appropriately move it into the, into the culvert. I had the county replace this bitty little pipe and put in a big old pipe underneath the roads so water moves properly there. So it doesn't destroy my land and doesn't, you know, create a situation where there would be a landslide that would impact the community and make it hard for the school bus to go by. So, you know, when you're dealing with all these sorts of things, you know, I, I, I hope you all look at or sort of partition things between needs and wants. And uh, I guess politics wise, you can kind of see my politics. I'm kind of like a moderate here. Election integrity. You know, our elections have never been more secure. Don't mean to bust the Republicans bubbles on that one, but, you know, they're pretty darn good, much better than other countries. And uh, in terms of immunity, no one's immune from president down to dishwasher. We are all under the U.S. federal constitution, period. Okay. So anyways, thank you so much for hearing me. I think this is good stuff. And I hope you folks continue to work with these gentlemen and think about all this. You have a fine day. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, first of all, I want to ask, where is the public's copy of this master uh, master plan? It's not in this little notebook, <laughs> and it's not out there. So um, it's not open to, it's not available to the public here today. Um, so that needs to be remedied. I want to say that, um, the, there are alternatives always to repairs of things and um, living in the rural area, uh, I'm on our road repair committee and I know how important those culverts are and the metal ones do rust out. But what we have done at a cost savings to our community is put in plastic sleeves that extend the life of the culverts and are much cheaper than a complete dig up and culvert replacement. I hope that is considered. I also uh, want to emphasize that the storm water conditions are greatly affected by the tidal conditions as we saw last winter. And um, that does need to be taken into account. Also, informationally, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency has installed a number of stream gauges uh, for their work and evaluation for the uh, area's basin, basin sustainability plan. So I would hope that the county would intertie with those informational sources to monitor stream levels. Um, I want to ask that stormwater be saved and pumped into recharge areas. There are a number of areas in the county that this could be done rather than just letting it fl all flow out to the sea. I want to ask why the uh, areas that are made priority were made by made priority. And I suppose that's in the master plan, but I didn't find it out here today. I want to say that Thank you.
See anyone else here in chambers? Is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers, Chair. Great. I will return it to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. All right, we have a motion by Director Friend, a second by Director Hernandez to approve the recommend ac recommended actions. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Clerk, will you uh, roll call vote, please? Certainly. Mm -hmm. Director Friend? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Alboni? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. With that, I will adjourn the Santa Cruz County Board of Directors Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5 and return it to Chair Cummings or at the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Supervisor Friend, or sorry, Koenig. Um, okay. So the next item on our agenda, on our regularly scheduled agenda, is item number nine, consider adoption of resolution pursuant to government code section 7522.56 and 21224, exempting the hire of an extra help retired annuitant from the 180-day waiting period as critical staffing support for the personnel department as outlined in the memorandum of the director of personnel. And with that, I will turn it over to staff, Ajita, per, uh, Ajita Patel, personnel director for a presentation on this item. Good morning, Chair Cummings and members of the board. In this item, my office is requesting your approval to exempt the re recently retired risk manager from the 180-day wait period prior to returning to the county as a retired annuitant. The waiver is permissible under CalPERS regulations if the retired annuitant provides critically needed services and your board concurs. The county's risk manager recently retired from the county after 10 years as a risk manager. A recruitment was launched in anticipation of the vacancy. Unfortunately, we were not able to successfully fill that vacancy right now. We are planning for a recruitment in the upcoming weeks. Meanwhile, it is necessary to maintain the ability to have somebody who has risk management expertise and technical historical knowledge when we're dealing with natural disaster storms and be able to have someone who can help us with decisions on insurances and et cetera. So with your approval, we'd like to submit the resolution to CalPERS to waive the 180-day period for Mr. Sagoon. If CalPERS approves that, we'd like to bring him back in a limited capacity to assist us on specific critical tasks. So with that, I'll conclude my comments and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'll open up to the board members to see if there's any questions or comments from board members on this item. Do you know the amount of time you, you're going to rehire is it the six months kind of period that they would get rehired for? So uh, retired annuitants are permitted to work for 960 hours in a fiscal year. Our hope is that we wouldn't need him for that long because we'll launch the recruitment and hopefully we're successful this time. But I do think it's important to sit, have him on the books, even if we're not using him in the chance that we ever need his historical knowledge. So we wouldn't be working him 40 hours a week. It's really limited for things that we think his expertise is needed. Supervisor Friend, do you have any questions on this item? Okay, I just had one question. I'm just curious what, um, why did we not see, you know, um, many applicants or for this position during the time when it was open? Or um, was it that we had, you know, applicants that weren't qualified for the position? I'm just trying to better understand. I know we've had recruitment issues at the county in a variety of different departments and for a variety of different reasons. And so in this instance, I'm just wondering kind of what, um, why we why we weren't able to find somebody. Sure. So the risk manager position has historically been difficult to recruit. The last time it opened up 10 years ago, we launched three recruitments. And Mr. Sagoon actually was an analyst in the CEO's office. And after the third recruitment, there was a battle for his expertise because he understood the funding around risk management funds, and then had also served in the personnel department in the risk division. So he had education experience that qualified. What we see in this position, it is a position that requires knowledge of insurances, how to mitigate loss, dealing with funding also. So we're looking for candidates 
who have experience in risk management, but have also an understanding of fiscal needs, right? They're managing high-level funds. For example, our tort liability fund has about $28 million in it. Our workers' compensation fund has about $20 million in it. So we need somebody who has both areas of expertise and the applications we received. We had candidates who were qualified, but maybe didn't have everything. However, we had one candidate who had the level of experience we needed in risk mitigation and the fiscal area. And he also received a job offer um, from his hometown where he chose to return. So we were number two and he had other offers. So got it. Well, it's just really helpful for us to understand kind of, you know, when it comes to hiring and recruitment, what are some of the barriers and challenges we're facing? All right. Um, if there's no other questions or comments from board members, I'll open up to members of the public who would like to speak on this item. Um, again, this is item number nine on our regularly scheduled agenda, and you can please approach the podium. Hi there. Yes, I have questions. Having worked in government, I've seen a lot of uh, former government employees double dip by retiring out and um, receiving their huge pensions and then coming back under contract work or what this is suggesting is that this person wants to come back. Will he be halting his government pension rather than double dipping um, to bleed taxpayers out of um, money? Um, I've listened to your comment about not being able to find someone and it didn't really sound true. I'm even more confused by what you said because people will learn their positions. They will learn their jobs. It sounds like you had a candidate who could have stepped into the position and grown with it. Um, why did this man um, retire if he wants to come back and work some more? So my concern is the double dipping and the misuse of retirement funds that impacts people like me who actually pay the bill for that. So I'm not in favor of it. I don't want to see people coming back and, and getting double salaries and stuff. I would like to see someone new step in and have the opportunity to grow in the position and learn the position. That would be fair. Thank you. I support what the uh, former speaker from the public said. And this is a problem statewide. I'm familiar with this, having done some research about it in the 14th District Agricultural Association. It is common, very common that um, people will retire, collect their CalPERS benefits, and then double dip and get uh, a contract work. So CalPERS does not uh, look favorably on this either. They feel that uh, granting jobs to retired annuitants takes away job opportunities from those who may have less experience, but as the former speaker said, can learn and grow into the job. So I think that looking for the perfect person with everything is not a good attitude. And I think we should be looking at people perhaps from within, the uh, county employees and um, train them for whatever level more they need. They have some of that um, uh, knowledge that would be valuable. So I'm not a, I'm not in favor of this either, and I don't think helpers would be either. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public here in person who'd like to speak to us on this item? Are you saying none? Are there any members of the public online who would like to speak to us on this item? Yes, chair. Call on user one, your microphone is now available. <laughs> Marilyn Garrett, um, the comments of the two previous speakers, I think calls for um, more examination of this issue. Uh, I'm, I hear of double dipping. Uh, they did that to teachers who had a different uh, work um, assignment prior to coming to teaching and said, oh, you're double dipping if you're collecting from both systems. I am excessively worried uh, about the double dipping of, you could call it the military budget and the wealthy taking 
gargantuan amount of funds that are just flabbergasting from from our community and from things we need. Um, I have a question. What does this person do? Risk management, mitigation, does that have to do with workers' compensation cases? Or could you elaborate on some of the responsibilities of this um, person? Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, thank you. With that, I'll bring it back to the board and close public comment period. I'm wondering if staff has any uh, response to some of the questions that were raised. Sure. So one of the things I can share is that the risk management division has workers' compensation programs underneath them, uh, county insurance, uh, unemployment um, claims, and we have the uh, budget funding for all our various funds, benefits, safety, um, so I think that what I would say to your board is that there we're not looking to have Mr. Sagoon perform the regular duties. As I put in the letter, the foot things that we are going to have him working on part time as needed is critical expertise items, staff mentoring, which I think some of the comments were leaning towards that. And I think we see that. And then really just historical knowledge. I think my concern as the director is that we have storms. We have had COVID, which we learned created a pandemic and we had many safety issues. We often are putting up, I'll use the example of shelters. We're putting up shelters when we're anticipating storms and a risk manager is responsible for ensuring that we our insurances cover some of the things that we are facing. And I believe his expertise is needed to ensure that we are protecting ourselves as a county, limiting our exposure and liability when we have these events. And it would be of great assistance to my department in ensuring that we're managing things properly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions from board members on this item? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Okay. Yes, we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor Hernandez. And I guess I'll just say that, you know, um, as we continue to make progress on, you know, really addressing some of the issues around recruitment and retention and hiring, I mean, this is a great example where we need to bring back people who have this expertise so they can keep the county whole as we continue to move through these uh, processes. And you know, it just also highlights um, the need for us to, you know, continue identifying what are the barriers to recruitment and retention and how we can work with folks in the community who do workforce development so that we can ensure that there are pathways for people to get in these positions. And that's externally and internally. But I want to thank um, Director Patel for bringing this forward so that we can make sure that we're protecting the county as it relates to risk, risk management. So with that, I'll hand it over to the clerk and uh, we'll have a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Coney? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Coney? Cummings? Aye. Sorry. That passes unanimously. All right, next item on our agenda, item number 10. Um, this is um, the board will consider a report with the initial recommendations on county commission restructuring, approving concept ordinance, repealing chapters 2.52, 2.56, 2.60, 2.84, 2.92, and 2.125 of the Santa Cruz County Code to sunset various advisory commissions and ordinance amending chapter 2.106 of the Santa Cruz County Code, Santa Cruz County Emergency Management Council. Schedule the ordinances for second reading and final adoption on February 13, 2024, and direct the county administrative officer to return on or before August 27, 2024, with further updates and recommendations as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. With that, I will turn it over to Nicole Coburn, assistant CAO, for a presentation on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cummings and members of the board. Um, I'm Nicole Coburn, assistant CAO. I'll be presenting this item. Um, I do wanna note that this work was done in coordination with department staff, and we have representatives here today from the Health Services Agency and the Human Services Department um, to answer questions on the commissions they support that are sub the subject of today's recommendations. 
So I wish to start out by just providing a little bit of background. Um, in 2023, as part of the Santa Cruz County Like Me effort to increase representation in local government, the board asked staff to review the county commission structure. This included staff and fiscal resources dedicated to supporting commissions. With this request, we went about the work of collecting information on county boards and commissions to create an inventory of their authority, membership, meeting frequency, and departmental support. Um, the county has over 40 boards, commissions, or other advisory bodies. About 29 of these have been established by the county. Mostly um, these are discretionary commissions that the county chose to stand up. Most of these advisory bodies are made up of county residents and advise the board on a large number of issues relating to housing, land use, gender, race, environmental issues, and health and human services, among others. Through our research, uh, we found that about 240 non-employee county residents serve on our commissions. County staff provide an average of 13 hours of support as liaisons to these commissions and the annual fiscal impact of staff resources allocated to maintaining commissions is close to $200,000. We also met with department heads and staff liaisons to discuss the county boards and commissions they support and ideas for potential restructuring. Uh, this is the first comprehensive review of our county's advisory bodies. Many of these bodies were established more than 45 years ago. We have commissions dating back to the 1950s. <clears throat> this review has provided an opportunity to consider how best to conduct the work of county commissions more efficiently, to preserve and use human and financial resources more productively, and to achieve greater public participation in commission and other work of the county. Uh, through this review, we had some major findings. Uh, one, that commissions, there are some commissions that do not meet due to lack of participation. This may be because we're either unable to fill vacancies, there might be a lack of interest, or we're unable to meet quorum. We also have commission work that overlaps with other groups, including other advisory bodies, and we have commissions that no longer appear to be needed or effective. Um, through this work, we also identified opportunities for improving the purpose, membership, and responsibilities of some of our commissions. Based on everything um, we found out through this process, um, we are recommending that the board consider sunsetting the commission shown here. Some of these commissions are going to be transitioning to other methods of public engagement and input. Um, we do want to thank all current and former members of these commissions for their dedicated service to, to the residents of the county. So I'm going to walk through each of these just briefly. Um, the first is the Emergency Medical Care Commission. Um, this has a number of responsibilities related to the county's emergency medical services system. The commission has been used to advise on pre-hospital medical care, but is duplicative of other groups and has experienced uh, challenges maintaining membership and quorum. Due to a lack of participation, there's a need to de develop or leverage more um, accessible options for community engagement. The Health Services Agency has multiple existing venues for this multidisciplinary stakeholder work, including the Pre-Hospital Advisory Committee and the Healthcare Coalition. The commission is not currently required and advisory functions would transition to the existing pre-hospital advisory com committee. The second one on the list is the Environmental Health Appeals Commission. Um, this commission was established to handle written appeals from denial, suspension, or revocation of permits, permits issued under the authority of the county health officer. There rarely are any appeals. The commission has not been meeting frequently at all. And this work can be handled through the administrative hearing process. Numerous departments use this process already, including environmental health, planning, the animal shelter, and others. Um, we also have the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, which was established to advise the board on the implementation of the county's hazardous materials, hazardous waste, and underground storage ordinance. Um, this discretionary commission has not met for more than two years and is not required, and we are recommending that the board consider sunsetting it. Um, the fourth commission on the list is the Human Services Commission, which was established more than 30 years ago. 
The commission advises the board on policies, priorities, and legislative matters. It also provides advice and counsel to the human services department on best practices in the operation of department programs and services. And lastly, it provides a forum for citizens affected by county human services programs and policies. Because nearly all services under the purview of HSD are mandated or regulated by the state and federal government, the authority um, of county government and an associated commission to influence these mandates and re related budgets is very limited. Staff see no advantage to maintaining a commission structure as a forum for discussions with community members on these issues. And they see an advantage with creating a departmental advisory group structure, which provides more flexibility to the department. Um, HSD and existing commission members have created an ad hoc subcommittee to help with the transition and creation of new advisory group bylaws. The fifth commission is a substance use disorder commission, which has a broad range of powers and duties related to county substance use disorder services. Many of these responsibilities now overlap with the mental health advisory board due to the continuum of services under behavioral health. Um, so this is another commission that we're recommending sunset. Uh, the last one on the list is the Syringe Services Program Advisory Commission. This is one of our newest commissions. It was established in 2019 and has a variety of powers and duties. Um, staff report that commi the commission's duties have been accomplished in frameworks for continued coordination, policy review, and federal and state legislative review have been established. The Health Services Agency would like to shift to more broad community, community involvement by leveraging coalitions um, led by nonprofits and other grassroots organizations in lieu of uh, keeping the commission. So the attached ordinance that with this board item, um, if the board were to approve the ordinance in concept, um, would allow for all commissions listed here to sunset on March 31st of 2024. This would give departments time to complete an existing work and provide for the transitions that were mentioned. Um, I do want to mention that we also identified various commissions needing some changes to composition, purpose, or meeting frequency. Um, they are listed here. Um, uh, first, the Commission on the Environment um, there's an interest in uh, clarifying the responsibilities of this commission. There's currently some overlap with the Water Advisory Commission and the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission. Um, so staff are going to be working on better um, clarifying and defining um, these three commissions responsibilities and also connecting the commission on the environment potentially more strongly to our climate action and adaptation plan. The Emergency Management Council um, is also listed here. OR3, our Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, is proposing changes to their membership to reduce the county staff membership and to remove the hospitals. They're hoping that the commission would focus more on preparedness and then the county staff who are on the county emergency management team would be more focused through those efforts of emergency uh, management and response. There is another ordinance attached to this item that would make these membership changes. Um, third on the list, Fire Department Advisory Commission um, was found to be underutilized and ineffective based on the recent findings of a 2023 report um, on master planning. It is widely recognized that the commission needs to change and staff are going to be working on what that looks like in return with a recommendation. Historic Resources Commission also has faced some challenges with quorum and engagement, but provides some critical um, <clears throat> services in terms of providing access to more streamlined CEQA processes and historic preservation grant funding. They are looking at changing the meeting frequency of that commission, which would help with um, engagement and our office supports that. Housing Advisory Commission, um, is also being looked at in terms of the, the composition of members on that commission. There's historically been a disproportionate number of people in the real estate industry on that commission. 
and staff are going to be working on changes that would help engage a broader cross-section of stakeholders, particularly those that are listed in county code, such as senior citizens, students, farm workers, low-income families, ethnic minorities, educators, and other groups that might represent their interests or needs. And then lastly, I want to point out that um, staff are working with the Circle on Anti-Racism, Economic, and Social Justice to discuss, to discuss the next phase of their work. Um, originally, when this CARES J came to the board, there was direction to create a formal commission related to okay. the work that this group has been engaged with. Um, we've been talking with CARES J about what that might that group might evolve into in alignment with the Santa Cruz County Like Me effort, um, how their work contributes to the broader equity work of the county, and how um, we're going to be holding the county accountable to the equity statement that was adopted by the board. So we'll we'll be continuing those conversations and we'll plan to come back to the board with further updates and recommendations in our honor before August 27th. So our recommendations this morning um, are to accept and file the report that's before you. We also have the ordinance repealing the six commissions that I mentioned. Um, your board would be approving those in concept today. Um, and then we have a second ordinance amending um, chapter 2.106 of the county code related to those emergency management council membership changes. Um, the ordinances would come back for a second reading and final adoption in February, and then we would return in August with additional updates. And with that, we're happy uh, to answer any questions, and department and I, staff and I um, are here to answer those. Thank you very much. Um, I'll bring it to the board to see if there's any questions on this item. Um, yes, yeah, Mr. Chair. This is another opportunity for all of us to really appreciate everybody who serves on these commissions and committees, um, put a lot of time and effort into it. And it um, it does take a lot of our uh, our staff time. Uh, and I think it's a good move for consolidation and, and efficiency and, and governing. <laughs> Excuse me. And I appreciate the work, uh, appreciate the work of the county staff. Uh, and the commissioners on the Santa Cruz like me, that um, the project, which is meant to ensure the county's advisory committees and commissions are more representative of our community. Um, I can support the recommended actions regarding the sunsetting of the commissions that are identified here uh, because the process really is divide, uh, designed for more efficiency. And I think uh, the reality of who, who is attending and what the needs are for our county. But I do think it's important that uh, we note that our syringe services program um, is still very much a work in progress <clears throat> and uh, may soon require uh, some additional direction and resources to this board. And as I mentioned earlier in the day, um, our next report from them is in March. And I'd like to see that um, uh, and, and really have a, a better sense of what, what is happening there. The uh, SSP Advisory Commission uh, provided some valuable insight uh, and recommendations to the board. And uh, in their absence, I expect our staff uh, will come to the board more regularly to uh, discuss those policies. But uh, I, I look forward to our next report uh, coming about that commission in March. Uh, so appreciate that. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have had a chance to check in with the members of a number of these commissions, and um, on the whole, uh, folks were in agreement with um, the disbandment of them, uh, with one exception. I mean, we heard today from two uh, members of the uh, Emergency Management, um, uh, sorry, Emergency Medical Care Commission, who called in Celia Berry and uh, Dr. Mark Yellen. Uh, Celia, of course, is the former County Emergency Medical Services Administrator, and Dr. Yellen, uh, as uh, he was trying to say, it was, a, it was a bit of a choppy connection, but has worked in our uh, Dominicans ER for the last 37 years. Um, and uh, they both have noted how uh, useful this commission is for sharing information. Um, at least within their community um, and making operational improvements. So, uh, you know, I agree that there could certainly be improvements to the commission, but I'm not ready to disband it today. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to bring up something that they mentioned, which was um, 
you know, challenges maintaining membership and quorum were cited as one reason for doing away with the commission. Um, and what I heard back from the members is that they would be reminded of the meetings a couple of days before. And then uh, if they didn't pretty much immediately respond, they'd be sent a second notice saying uh, the meeting was canceled for lack of a quorum. Mm -hmm. I think that can be particularly challenging uh, when you're a doctor dealing with a lot of demands, uh, maybe to um, be sure to respond to a communication on, on that quick timeline. So it's possible that um, you know, we just need to notify folks consistently for all these commissions uh, at least a week ahead of time um, and provide you know at least a few days for people to reply before actually canceling a meeting. Um, so I would recommend that uh, we, we hear any suggestions uh, for how to improve the emergency medical services uh, I'm sorry, Emergency Medical Care Commission uh, when we get a report back on the other commissions uh, in August. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Um, Supervisor Friend, do you have any comments on this item? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I'm in agreement with Supervisor Koenig's uh, points, which is to say that I think that there it's clear that there's reforms needed across the board, which is why uh, we brought this up a few years ago as something that the board should consider in a more macro consideration. I mean, when you don't look at things for 40 years, obviously uh, there is a need for change, generally speaking, on some, but not all. On the MCC, I think that uh, there's understanding and agreement within the members that there needs to be some modifications. I think the question is whether or not uh, I mean, the presentation stated that the the functions would be transferred over to functionally two other uh standing committees um they didn't seem as though there was uh agreement from emcc members that those functions really did translate that way and so i thought it just made sense uh, if we're going to make that kind of statement that uh, we can actually back that information up it seems to make sense to to give some additional time to have additional input from them especially considering they're willing it, it seems that there's clear that there's an understanding that that it may be reformed whether it remains as a commission uh, turns into a departmental advisory group, et cetera, I think a little bit of additional time will have it. I did also speak to my other commissioners on some of these other commissions that are proposed for uh, merger consolidation or sunset, and uh, there seemed to be um, a real understanding of why it was moving that way and um, an appreciation for the fact that there would still be key elements of it and including key members still having a voice of directly advising uh, county staff and certain concepts. So I appreciate the fact that those commissions felt engaged. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Hernandez. So I have um, two questions, a general question and a question I had the opportunity to ask you already as well. Uh, but would the appointed commissioners be asked if they would like to participate on the, the newly formed committees or uh, existing committees that are going to open up? And the the question I asked was if uh, the Human Services Commission would also maintain the appointed members uh, into the advisory committee. Yeah, I might have um, Randy Morris, director of Human Services, come up, but I, I do believe there is an interest in, in, in having those who currently serve on a commission transition into the advisory group or whatever the other <laughs> form of engagement that takes place. But I'll let Randy speak to that. Um, that's correct. Uh, we had a commission meeting where this was discussed. Um, and if we switch to a departmental advisory group, should your board, board approve this um, or create an ad hoc committee to work together on those bylaws? Um, there was some concern about what, what would happen with a successor board or a successor director, because right now the board and the director are really interested in being engaged with the new group. So we actually proposed building into the bylaws of the advisor group that board members still get to have a role in sort of recommending who participates. So the default is every current commissioner who would like to maintain involvement would be the beginning departmental advisor group. And we would hope we would just transition seamlessly and just remove some things like we haven't met quorum because some could, people couldn't make it in person. And under Brown Act, you can't have a quorum for people participating virtually. We could have hybrid meetings. We'd have some capacity, but the default would be to have the exact same group. And then we could allow it to grow from there as um, as we work through um, the, the, the transition if approved. Does that answer your question? Yes. Would we continue to appoint them afterwards or would it 
we a one-time deal. I, I believe if I've read the departmental advisory group um, structure here in the county is the technical issue is the department director actually doesn't appoint through a formal process for you, but I had recommended the commission and it would be up to your board because we have to bring the bylaws back to you is that each board district still maintains a role in recommending to or whatever we want it, we can work it through together and then that live in the bylaws. So I think technically it's not an appointment, but I think it's a recommendation and then we kind of set up the new advisory group through that agreement. So it's a little less formal, but it would be in the bylaws. No further questions. Okay. Um, I have some, I have a few questions and comments and I think I share some concerns that are brought up by some of the other board members. Um, the first question I have is I'm just curious. It was mentioned that there's coordination with commission staff, but I'm wondering what level of outreach there was with commissioners, because it sounded like there were some commissioners who even came and spoke today who felt kind of blindsided by this item coming forward right now. And so I'm just wondering, was this brought to commissions for conversations kind of prior to um, these recommendations? Yeah, we started, um, I mean, we started in the fall talking with the departments about this and our intention was for them to take this discussion to the commissions. And I believe, the commissions were, um, this was placed on an agenda and there were conversations that were held with these commissions that relate to the health and human services departments. Okay. Um, in the emergency medical care commission item, you mentioned that some of these, um, some of their role is duplicative in other groups. I'm just wondering what other groups those are. For which commissions? For the Emergency Medical Care Commission. It didn't It didn't actually have the other groups in the agenda item. It just said that um, some of their work is duplicative of yeah. the groups. I believe there are two that have been identified for certain. And, um, you know, uh, the Director of Health Services, if there are others that I'm missing, um, she might be able to speak to those. Um, but pre the Pre-Hospital Advisory Committee was one. And then the Healthcare Coalition was a second one where similar issues were being discussed. We also have um, our emergency management council where um, the emergency services administrator it sits on both. And so there's a connection there as well. Yeah, thank you, uh, board. For the record, Monica Morales, Health Services Agency Director. Uh, hello, Jen Herrera, Assistant Director for HSA. Um, we actually have been looking at this very critically to ensure that we can actually have functional active with community participation in our committees. And so the recommendations that you see in front of you were not taken lightly. Um, we took different approaches. We did one-on-ones with some of the members. We also um, were trying to address them in our actual commission meetings because some of them also didn't have quorum. Again, the issue that we're experiencing, um, we did a lot of, try to do a lot of one-on-ones with them. Um, I would highlight that specifically for the EMCC, um, there is duplication in terms of the work that we're trying to do. Um, as Nicole mentioned, we have existing committees where some of these topics are included or discussed. And I'll let Jen now talk a little bit more about some of those details and opportunities that we're seeing. Our intent is not to um, silent individuals or look just for efficiencies. Our intent is to make sure that these commissions, for example, SSB, we always have been working to try to include those that we're representing in the meetings, but the brown eye makes it very difficult. You can't just get up and talk, right? And as a member of a community experiencing SSP needs, it, the flexibility that the Brown Act, the lack of flexibility that the Brown Act offers it has really been an issue for the commission members and um, for our community members. But Jen, maybe you can give a little more detail. Uh, yes, yeah, so the pre-hospital advisory uh, committee, which is uh, ran by our emergency medical um, services program, EMS, uh, which is the program that runs EMCC currently, uh, there that is where we see the most overlap. Um, we also see some overlap participants. And the goal of the pre-hospital advisory committee is to look at that pre-hospital, also known as our emergency services system before people get into the hospital or emergency room system. Um, so a lot of, we do believe that there are a lot of the activities can align there. In addition to that, we also have our healthcare coalition that has a wide variety of partners. Um, 
uh, apart from just emergency services. So we can look at that entire system of care from pre-hospital to hospital admission to discharge. Um, and we do emergency planning uh, with that group as well. Thank you. Um, moving on with the Environmental Health Appeals Commission, I'm just wondering um, if you can explain a little bit more about the administrative hearing process that could be used in lieu of the commission itself. Yeah, this is a, a process that's set up in county code. Um, we have hearing officers that are on contract through our office that hears appeals um, based on different things, um, different lines of business in our county. The hearing officer will, will have a hearing where it's hearing from both sides related to a particular issue and then reaches a decision. And then um, based on that decision, uh, the person who has appealed has a right to either accept that or if they disagree, they can um, appeal further to the superior court. Um, so there, there's a number of um, departments, like I mentioned, that already use the administrative hearing process. It's been around for, for a while now and planning animal shelter, environmental health, and I believe some others are actively using it. Got it. Thanks for that clarification. Um, with the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, I'm just wondering if any of those roles and responsibilities can be transferred to the Integrated Waste Management uh, Task Force because we already talk about waste and um, you know our ability to either process waste here in the county, but this does sound like a, a commission where that information or that those conversations could move to the Integrated Waste Management Task Force, and so I think it, that could be a one way of consolidating. Um, what's discussed in that commission with what we discussed at the Integrated Waste Management Task Force. I can definitely take that suggestion to that other task force. Um, as it relates to the Human Services Commission, this is probably the one that I have the most um, concern with. I mean, when looking at the staff report, you know, the, um, the commission, you know, was really established to discuss and provide recommendations on policies that affects socioeconomic needs of low-income, disabled, disadvantaged, and at-risk people. And uh, given the amount of work that we're trying to do around equity these days, it seems like that's a commission that we would want to kind of see how it's been less effective currently and how can we make it more effective? Because one concern I have is that um, if we can have an advisory body model, you know, do we have public meetings? Are there minutes being taken? You know, those are the, some of the concerns I have. Currently, so I think that my comfort would be if that can all if if the substitute for what this commission would be can be outlined and explained before we take action to eliminate it, I'd be more comfortable with moving forward with that. But given that we don't know what this next model is going to be, the notion that it's going to be dissolved at the end of March has me concerned since we don't know, you know, what the alternative will be. Yeah, it's my understanding a departmental advisory group can still follow similar. Uh, practices as a commission in terms of having a meeting open to the public, keeping agendas and minutes, um, all of that. I, I think one of the advantages is that if should they not have all the members show up, they can still hold the meeting. They can also meet in different venues in different ways than you know, a commission might have to adhere to. So it provides a little bit more flexibility, but but they can they can adhere and provide the same level of public transparency as a commission. I think it would, I think it would be good for us to consider then having that be outlined for us and, and, you know, make a decision on what that next group would be rather than saying that we're going to dissolve the group today. Personally, that's just, those are just my feelings about that commission in particular. Um, as it relates to substance use disorder, I think it'd be great to just have some, you know, something come back that talks about how this is getting folded under the mental health advisory board. So we know where those responsibilities are going. Um, and then with the syringe services programming, that's, that's one. If we, if we were to keep the human services commission, that's something that I could see get transferred there since it deals with how, how low income people and people who are um, experiencing substance abuse, potentially, you know, how they're getting access to syringes. So that's another thing that, you know, maybe could be taken into consideration in terms of how it's consolidated. Um, I think 
uh, the Commission on the Environment. The staff recommendations sound fine to me on that. Um, and as also the Fire Department Advisory Commission, I think it's a pretty sensitive topic. We met with Mike Beaton um, from General Services, and he's he and the uh, Fire Chief are willing to come up to Bonnie Dune to discuss the dissolution of that. But I think you know, just given the impacts of fires in our community, trying to figure out how we can have something that's effective for making recommendations to us, I think is the really important thing as we're moving into seeing, you know, more intense fires in our community. Um, with the Historic Resources Commission, um, I'm just wondering if there's indigenous representation because it might be, as we're thinking about how to restructure that commission, having a seat for someone who's from a local tribe could be a good way of increasing representation on that commission. And then lastly, with the Housing Advisory Commission, um, I think it might be worth us exploring having it be an affordable housing commission. I mean, we building market rate housing here is not a problem. I mean, we're the most expensive county in the nation when it comes to rental prices, and we have some of the most expensive um, real estate markets in the entire country, if not the entire world. And, you know, really having a commission to the point that was brought up, you know, in terms of increasing representation, it would make sense for us to have a commission that's not just focused on all housing, but really is focusing on the housing that we need for our workers, for low income people, keeping people from, you know, ending up losing their homes um, versus just housing in general, which then what we found is that we have a board that's overwhelmingly represented by um, kind of like real estate interest. So those are just my suggestions and recommendations. Uh, and um, if there's no other questions, I can open up for public comment. But I want to look to see if there's any further comments or questions from board members. Just something brief, Mr. Chair, sure, if that's okay. Sure. I think that one of the reasons we were looking into this was also because it's it can be difficult to maintain membership. I mean, we, uh, if I'm correct on this, I think I make 62 appointments to boards and commissions, not just with the county, but some of the other ancillary boards and commissions we serve on that have their own advisory and it's it's a challenge to maintain and if we sometimes become too prescriptive on trying to ensure that every interest is represented we, we will be unsuccessful so i think that we need to find a balance between representation and also the practicality of, of these appointments and and so uh i just wanted to flag that as we move forward to look at the continued as we continue to look at some of these commissions and some of the recommendations you had made, I was just thinking about how uh, fielding a board would work from a practicality standpoint. And that is another element that I think we need to, to keep in mind. Thank you. Appreciate those comments, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Hernandez. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to explain why my two questions about keeping the appointed commissions, you know, because I've heard of advisory committees that have little or one uh, person from South County. And, you know, I, I had to Google who that person, who this person was. Uh, so my concern is equity um, that, you know, Justin stated, and there's little assurance that South County will be represented in uh, advisory committees. So I just want to make sure that there is the level of equity and that South County is represented or an assurance, right? Because that's what concerns me. I think the, um, the, you know, the Santa Cruz like me project was really a, a good uh, avenue for us to make sure of that uh, wherever it may be in the county, uh, which whichever district. And I, I think we're accomplishing some of that with what we have in order is how is that working with, the system we have right now. Yeah, and being applied. That, to answer Supervisor Hernandez's question, you know, I think we share your interest in maintaining, meeting our equity goals and maintaining an increasing representation from those groups that are currently underrepresented. That's what a Santa Cruz County like me has been all about was to diversify our groups and to bring more voices to um, county commissions and, and local government to be able to provide your board with advice on these critical issues. So um, I think, you know, we share that and that would be a goal of ours for those advisory groups. I mean, that'd be an overall policy, so to speak, or target that we want to meet. And so I think uh, what we have done in that regard, I think is the best way to address it. It applies to every commission, every committee, whatever. You know, Santa Cruz like me. 
Supervisor Koenig. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just, uh, in defense of the Housing Advisory Commission, I uh, just wanted to point out I mean, they, they certainly do address affordable housing issues. In fact, the sustainability update uh, that we approved earlier today was in many ways spurred on by the Housing Advisory Commission, um, and they were instrumental in um, the initiation of our county of uh, affordable housing density bonus. Um, so, I mean, they absolutely have this interest in mind. And of course, uh, you know, you're welcome to appoint whoever you like to the Housing Advisory Commission if you feel that uh, current folks are, are are not pro affordable housing enough. Um, for example, one of my appointees is Simply Simon, who uh, manages New Way Homes um, with you know the explicit goal of building affordable housing. So um, I, I just really value everything that the, the Housing Advisory Commission has done for us. Again, I no way no way want to speak ill of the work that has been done. I think what what I'm trying to highlight is that, you know, the biggest crisis that we're facing in this community is affordable housing and having a commission that could be very much focused on affordable housing. And as was raised in the staff report, you know, having a variety of representation that would help make it a more equitable commission would be a benefit. And so um, that was the, the main reason why I was suggesting that, you know, rather than just being a broad housing advisory commission, having something that's really targeting affordable housing and those kinds of policies would be a great benefit to the community, just given how expensive it is here. So um, with that, though, I think I'm gonna, um, if there's no other comments at this time, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Um, I know we have a couple other items on the agenda, so I'm going to open up to the public to um, have make comments on um, item number 10 on our agenda. And you'll be given two minutes and we'll start with people, members of the public who are here present um, at the meeting and then we'll move on to those who are joining us online. So you can speak, please step forward. Good afternoon, David Schwartz, candidate, District 2, Supervisor. Um, without uh, saying whether I'm for or against this, I, I would like to recommend a few little things. Um, all these commissions should have a public mandate, basically. I, I think the public needs to say whether they want these commissions or not, number one. Number two, we should have clear, measurable, objective criteria for each one of these commissions so that we have a way to grade them, you know, whether we're where we can make these decisions more often. Um, but this is a great thing because we need to carry this a little farther down the line. Everything that the county does, every department, every service that we provide should have these clear, measurable objectives. And we should be reviewing them on a periodic basis. And maybe we are doing that. But, um, you know, if the public's not happy about something that's going on, that should make us want to look at these things a little more clearly and see if there's something that we need to do. Um, these periodic reviews are, are very, very helpful. This issue about whether we should have more um, more people making the decisions or not is clear. I mean, we, we do want more people involved. If you have a problem getting enough people to have a quorum, maybe you should consider reducing the size of those boards. I don't know what the board size is right now, but uh, in, in my work with nonprofits, we find a lot of times that we have the same problem. And by reducing the board number to say 11, where you only need five people show up, six people show up, that's gonna be better than a board of 15. So there's there's a number of things that we can do to get people to help out, but definitely we need their help and we need to appreciate them for that. And so my, my big thank you to the whole community that helps with this and to you folks as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, I'm concerned about the use of corporate terms such as stakeholder to holders and administration. I'm Rhonda. I'm one of the people of California. I took the opportunity to look at these gold fringe flags and go outside and look at the non gold fringe flag. And I feel like a frog being boiled in water and watching my country and my county and my state be destroyed. Zach, you said um, a republic requires representation and then you made it sound like it was a hassle. And there is a difference between democracy and a republic. And in a democracy, two wolves and a sheep decide what's for dinner and the two wolves vote to eat the sheep and the sheep is the dinner. In a republic, 
two wolves have one vote, one sheep has one vote. So there's a stalemate and the sheep doesn't get eaten for dinner. Um, I'm happy to sit on these commissions. I spent a lot of year coming to these meetings, going to the city council, educating myself. I'm retired somewhat and I have time to do it. I'm looking at the time that these commission meetings are being held, which people who work and have two or three jobs to pay the rent here can't attend. So that's probably one of the pressures and the problems. I'm very concerned about things being routed to this CARES J group because I'm very concerned about what their real goals are. And so I'm not in favor of that. And um, Madam, you keep referring to some people and some, you know, uh, means to bring complaints to, but you're not giving me names. I want specific names. And those of us who are negatively impacted in the family court system know that the appeals process is fraud. There's a lot of crime that's happening at all levels. And these fake agencies that are there to hear appeals are really just bearing a lot of fraud. So a lot of these issues are concerning me. I do believe we need to educate the public to be able to participate more in our republic. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Becky Steinbruner. I attend many of these commissions that are being discussed here today. And I want to first of all point out that their composition are large is largely uh, directed by you, the supervisors. You decide who uh, you appoint to these commissions. You have the opportunity to change the composition of them. So I encourage you to do that. And many people would probably like to do that if you would bring that up regularly in your town hall meetings. But many of you don't have those anymore. So please start having town hall meetings and talk about these commissions. The purpose of them is to be a liaison between you and the public and to bring information and make recommendations to you based on what they're hearing out there that you may not be having access to. The public needs to have this access because we don't have it. By coming here, things are a done deal by the time they get here. But when we go to the commissions, we have the opportunity to make a real change on things that we care about. I think uh, a good example of that is the Hazardous Materials count, uh, Commission. That was the only way I was able to get the county's ear that eventually went to the district attorney's office when Swenson pulled out uh, an underground storage tank full of toxic material and hauled it out in the night. Nobody was going to do anything, but I went to that commission and the DA stepped in. So we need those sorts of things as we need the Environmental Appeals uh, Board. That is directed at septic uh, problems. And I think that it should be in force. It looks like it has professionals on there and is um, should, would save money instead of the county hiring a contractor to, to handle these administrative appeals. I really miss Dean Lundholm <laughs> with affordable... Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. We are actually behind schedule right now, and and I really appreciate it. I really appreciate. It. I'm. Thank you. We really appreciate your engagement. And if you, thank you. Appreciate that. Are there any members of the public online who would like to comment on this item? Oh, we have one more in person who would like to comment on this item. Please step forward. I just happened to stumble into this meeting right now. I just, um, I came down here to find out what was going on in Department 10. And, um, you know, from what I've um, been looking at it, it looks like a bunch of fictitious lawsuits that are happening and litigations that don't even, that, that are being um, done on, in behalf of people that don't exist. And I'm curious to know what's going on in Department 10, um, because I find that they're suing they're suing people that don't exist that are either incarcerated or, uh, you know, um, or deceased, mixing their names around and having litigations that for people that don't even exist. 
And that's kind of a problem I've been having. And then also with this, sir, I hate to interrupt you, but we're the item that we're talking about right now is um, an item that is uh, on county commissions and committees. And yeah, I'm sure that is, you know, I just, I happened to come in here and I wanted to bring that to somebody's attention in case anybody you know, cares to look into it. Okay. You know, thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public online who would like to address us on this item? Yes, sir. Sure. Yellen family, your microphone's available. However, I do believe the speaker may have already spoken. Yellen family, is your microphone available? Please use star six to mute or unmute. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yes, me now? Can. Okay, sorry. I'll make this very quick. I thank you for your time and consideration. A couple of comments. Um, firstly, the, uh, the the consideration of ruling the EMCC into the pre-hospital PAC uh, committee. Um, in my opinion, I've served on the PAC for for many many years. It is a committee that number one reports to the EMS medical director, not to the board of supervisors. The EMCC reports to the board of supervisors. The PAC pre-hospital advisory committee deals with nuts and bolts and details, how much of one drug to use, which drugs to use, which equipment to use, who goes first. Um, our meetings are full with dealing with policies and procedures. The EMCC takes a much bigger, broader view of the bigger picture. And um, it is not really substituted by any other committee um, that we currently have. EMS management, as I said earlier, is an amalgamation collaboration of highly technical, highly specialized, detail-oriented uh, groups, specialties with high consequence of their activities, fire, law, ambulance, et cetera. The intertwining of that to make the system work and work well um, is not replicated in you know, our public health department. It is not part of human health and services. All those great committees do other work, but this really is a standalone item. And the EMCC has functioned very well over the past many years. The issue of quorum, I would say, Suggest has to do more of the after effects of COVID and how that changed our meeting profile, as well as there are administrative aspects, as the, um, Supervisor Koenig recommended, that could better make the response work. And there's also the opportunity for hybrid meetings. So I just wanted to put that on the table for you folks and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Michael, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Um, this is Michael Lewis. Jean Brocklebank is with me here as well on this computer, and she will have her two minutes to um, present after mine. So please keep us connected at the end of my remarks. Um, I support the changes that the County Commission is proposing with the exception of the Hazardous Material Advisory Commission. Um, I publish Santa Cruz online, and I spend a lot of my time every week dealing with the uh, commission staff or county staff that support these commissions. From August of 2022, my efforts to publish information about the Hazardous, Advisory, uh, Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission has been stymied by this commission's lack of online notice of meetings and ongoing status due to numerous changes in the Environmental Health Department staff support for this commission. Over the past three years, I've corresponded and spoken with 11 different county staff members about this ongoing problem. To date, nothing has changed. In my experience, the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission is a vital and potentially effective advisory body that has languished due to lack of county interest and support, not for any problems with the commission's organization and purpose, nor any uh, problems having a quorum or public participation. I ask you to please keep the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission intact and instead arrange for effective county staff support for this very important advisory body. Thank you very much. Please reset our time for Jean Brocklebank's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Your time has been reset to two minutes. You can begin when you're ready. Hi, I am a member of a county commission that is not on your list today uh, and have been for years. So I am aware of how commissions can or cannot provide a service to your board and the public. Um, our commission was also formed like the Hazardous Materials Commission uh, many years ago uh, due to a specific ordinance. Ours was 1982. Um, 
Initially, I wrote to all of you supervisors individually, um, supporting the elimination of five of the six on today's list. However, after hearing comments both from Supervisor Koenig and from uh, uh, some members of that commission, um, I'm going to include the medical, uh, Emergency Medical Care Commission on my request. With regard to the Hazardous Materials Commission, I read their biennial report from 2022-2023. And you can tell by that report that this commission remains ready to do its job. It just needed the staff support to do that. So I'm asking you to either please amend this motion today to eliminate uh, EMC and the Hazardous Materials Commission from the list or continue this item until uh, uh, next month or another month. I think there's too much controversy and I think that your board has had a chance to listen to commissioners who are engaged in this, not <clears throat> even though I appreciate uh, everything that Nicole and her staff has done. We are commissioners and we didn't have a chance to talk with you. So thank you for considering my request. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, I want to eliminate corporations that continue to pollute the environment and create all these hazardous materials. Corporations privatize the profit and they socialize the cost. All of these, practically these commissions that you listed for sunsetting have to do with uh, pollution and pharmaceutical pollution. And let's see, all of them practically, um, environmental health. And something ironic, a friend of mine was on the Environmental Health Commission that met in your county building. And the radiation from the Wi-Fi and um, all the cell things on the roof and the cell tower made her feel quite ill and she had to quit. How strange environmental health. It seems to me like uh, eliminating these uh, commissions excludes or further limits public participation and public comment. It seems very abrupt and sudden. Why? I wonder if some commissions had exposés of county policies that they're trying to censor. I don't know. Um, I think this also points out how we need single payer health care or Medicare for all. And in terms of the Mental Health Advisory Commission, I went to some of their meetings about a friend of mine who's a senior and the abuse she suffered by this county with force injections and being hauled off to the hospital and they did you, nothing. Garrett. Thank you for your comments. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for um, further discussion and action. And I just wanted to see if um, if staff had any responses on some of the questions that were raised. Um, I do know uh, Mr. Morris had some additional information related to the Human Services Commission. So, yeah, I just was tracking some of the public comments and board comments. So I just wanted to, if this helps you deliberate, wanted to respond to some of those. Um, so first, the departmental advisory group does require there to be minutes taken. So I just wanna make sure that would be exchanged. So minutes would still be taken. Um, for your board's full awareness, if you didn't know, this was an exercise, I didn't quite know the scope. So we already have three existing commissions that are federally and state mandated that will continue, that will be Brannock governed. That's the federal governance mandate for the homeless uh, committee that Supervisor Koenig and Cummings are on. And that's the Housing for Health Partnership, the Continuum Care 
We have a state mandate for the in-home supportive services to have a public um, commission. It's called the Public Authority Advisory Commission. And we have a federal mandate to have the Workforce um, Investment, the Workforce Development Board have a commission. So those three commissions will still exist. Um, we also have uh, approximately 30 forums that are recurring where division directors and program managers and analysts are meeting regularly with uh, the community, predominantly community-based organizations, um, but also with community where there's a lot of dialogue. Um, I did want to say just as a staff-centric, I admit, perspective as somebody who's been facilitating the Human Services Commission from I got here, it is correct that this has clearly been in the COVID context. It's been a sort of hard to compare what will life be like after COVID. But what I do find is the many, many meetings I'm in with the community, the Brown Act and the commission really precludes conversation with the public because there's a public comment period where the public can show up. They rarely do. But when they do, I can't comment on it and engage in a dialogue if it's not an agendized issue. One of the reasons I saw benefit in making the switch is then we could have more of an open conversation with who comes up. We don't have to, if we have something just happened the day before, we can, as a kind of advisory group, kind of sit and discuss and make a change. And should the public be engaged, we can have conversation and not be prohibited um, under the Brown Act. Um, I also wanted to respond to Supervisor Hernandez's comment. Um, I've come here and I've learned really quickly when I got here, there's inequity with South County and North County. The commission has each board member appoint a commissioner. I want to repeat my comments that I recommended that the bylaws that get replaced them would have each board member to make sure we have equitable distribution of participants in that new structure. So I don't see that as a change. We could build that in um, to the bylaws. And then Finally, um, I have found that so many people have adapted to the post-COVID world of meetings being hybrid and virtual and having smart boards. We have just had too many um, meetings canceled due to quorum where if we were able to display people on the smart board, we actually could have had the meeting. So I think there's some flexibility in the shift if your board supports it. So I just wanted to share that information in response to some of the um, points you brought up. And Chair, I just I just uh, want to add that I just need to to speak with Director Morris a little bit more about about that one comment about the board members appointing or advising on members of the advisory commission because really the advisory commissions are department oriented commissions they're they they are advisory to the department head they're not responsible and advisory to the board members. And there are some Brown Act implications that would be involved if the board were to be involved in um, in appointing. So I'll, I'll check in and we'll talk more about those issues. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I guess I'll just say based on that, I, I think with, with the recommendations were given from Supervisor Koenig, um, keeping the medical Emergency Medical Care Commission and the Human Services Commission to me seems like something that would be beneficial at this point until we can hear more about how we can address some of these issues related to um, board members being able to appoint. I also have some concern too because you know we just went through a long exercise of trying to um, get commissioners um, stipends so they can participate on these commissions. And if we start moving commissions to these departmental advisory bodies, does that mean we're now going to have to go back and shift those policies as well? Because, you know, that's something that we were trying to implement to increase equity on our boards. And, um, and I get that some of these boards, it makes sense to eliminate, but these two in particular seem like boards that um, people really want to be engaged on. I heard from my commissioner that the human services board is, they have well attended meetings. And, you know, I think that we need to give it a chance for us to see how our new policies on providing financial support for commissioners, how well that's effective at getting more participation on our boards. Um, but I do see the merits of some of these other um, commissions, the Environmental Health Appeals Commission, Substance Use Disorder Commission, Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, certain services. I can see the merit and benefit of having those um, duties and responsibilities transferred to other commissions, um, but I'd, I'd see the value in saving um, the Emergency Medical Care Commission and Human Services Commission. So um, those are my, I guess, my final comments on this, um, but then I'll leave it to the board for further action and deliberation on this. Sure. I'll, I'll move the recommended actions with the modification that 2.52 be removed from the second recommended action and that other options for improving the emergency medical care commission be considered as part of the CAO's updates on commission restructuring on or before August 27th. 
So, Supervisor, given the um, the complications around us presenting two ordinances in one item, um, if I could provide a little bit of guidance around a motion um, that that might help us get further along. If if I didn't hear there being any comments on the emergency um, management council ordinance, if there are, if I was two point five two, no, that's zero. That's that's uh, not oh, sorry. Oh, you're all oh, right. Right. So, so the ordinance that 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 your if if your board is uh, in agreement on that second ordinance, I would recommend that you take a quick roll call vote with a motion to adopt that ordinance, bring it back for a second read on February uh, at, at the board's next meeting, and order that summary of that ordinance to be published, and do that first, and then take a motion on the second issue, which I'll get to after that roll call vote, if your board agrees. All right, then uh, I will move recommended action three to approve in concept ordinance amending chapter 2.106 of the Santa Cruz County Code, Santa Cruz County Emergency Management Council. Second. Okay, any other further discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote on that first recommended action. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. All right. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. So that first action passes unanimously. We'll move on to the other action items. Okay. The, um, on, on, the, on the other ordinance, what we, what we typically do, if it's not an urgent item, is we would get a motion on, on to come back mm -hmm. for a first read on the ordinance that you want to see because it... We can't adopt a portion of an ordinance in this meeting. An alternative to that is, is we could go away for 10 minutes and I could write up replacement pages and bring you back a different ordinance to look at on first read based on your comments here today. But um, I think a, a, an appropriate motion may be to um, tell us which commissions you would agree to have sunsetted as of the end of March. And we will bring back an ordinance on first read at the next meeting to address those specific commissions. Thank you for that advice. I think in the interest of time, it would make sense for because we do have a closed session item and then we have an item that was pulled from the regular agenda. And I know some individuals from that group are here with us today. So in the interest of time, I think it might make sense for us to make a motion on the the items, the commissions that we will want to remove and call those out and have those come back for a first reading. Okay, I will move that uh, we direct County Council to return with an ordinance that sunsets uh, the want me to explicitly name them, the Environmental Health Appeals Commission, Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, Human Services Commission, Substance Use Disorder Commission, and Syringe Services Program Advisory Commission, and that other options for improving the Emergency Medical Care Commission be considered as part of the CAO's updates on commission restructuring on or before August 27th. Are we going to the response also from the Oh, your mic's on. Are we going to wait for a response on some of the comments that that uh, County Council said, and some of the some of the things that uh, Chair uh, Supervisor Chair um, Cummings asked about on the Human Services Commission? Um, I don't. Sh I, mean, I I I guess I don't share the concerns. I do believe that, given uh, you know, as was stated in the. Um, staff memo that because these a lot of the services uh, that uh, are in theory the commission speaks on are actually uh, programs through the state that um, there might be other more effective avenues for uh, public engagement on this topic. I'll second the motion. Yeah, the um, well, the, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the um, syringe services program, they're in they're very much completing their work in progress. And it might um, require additional direction. Um, and they're going to come back in March. 
I guess we could reestablish that if we had to, or not had to, if if we wanted to. Um, I'll go ahead with the uh, the motion as presented, but I think that it's a work in progress that additional material might be uh, good for us to consider before we eliminate them. Uh, but I'll, I'll go along with the motion uh, with the idea that we could reestablish that commission um, if need. Yes, you could. You could reestablish it if needed. It's your board's discretion. And as I'm understanding the motion, I'm going to bring back an ordinance that's going to address all of the commissions on the list other than the Emergency Medical Care Commission. Correct? Correct. Right. And I think um, also it's a first read of that new ordinance um, would be another opportunity to make sure that uh, we are expected to receive a report around uh, syringe services in March as um, you anticipate Supervisor McPherson. I'll just make a brief comment real quick. Um, while I'm not going to support the motion, I would say that one of the things that could be considered is, you know, those conversations around syringe services. If there's another commission that's having similar conversations, maybe those com the conversations around syringe services could be moved to another commission. That way, we don't have to reestablish a commission, but we can have those conversations still ongoing. So, yeah. All right. So we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor Friend. Is there any further questions or comments on this item? The clerk does just request slight clarification. Um, there are additional recommendations on the original item, and I just want to make sure that we get a resolution on what's happening with those. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm also understanding this motion correctly. Um, does this motion include direction to publish the summary and to schedule the initial um, the ordinance related to the Emergency Management Council. Does that include the directive to publish the summary and to bring it back on the 13th for a second read? I understood that as part of the original, uh, the first motion. I understood that to be the case that the that the board was adopting those two recommended actions. Okay, thank you. Right, and then um, and I don't know if the if we need to come back to accept the report, but that was one of the items too. It was on here. I defer to council. Yeah, you you could or you don't have to one one way or another. The recommended actions, um, um, if 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 they are not adopted, then they just die on their own. Okay. All right. If there's no further questions or comments, uh, call for a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. No. That motion passes with. Fernandez, Koenig, Friend, and McPherson voting in favor, and Cummings voting it. Uh, no. Okay, with that, is there, is there any other business to be had on this item? Nope. Seeing none, we will move on to our next item, and I believe this is item number 11.1. .1. Um, this was originally item number 55 on our agenda. Uh, item 51. Oh, sure. Item 51, my apologies. Um, the approved agreement with Integral Consulting in the amount of $692,608 to prepare a sea level rise vulnerability assessment and local coastal plan amendment and take related actions as recommended by the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. And I'll turn this back to Supervisor Koenig who pulled this item. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. Um, I'm just going to recommend that uh, we put this uh, study back out to bid. We only received one bid, um, and I'm somewhat suspicious of that bid, given that it is uh, within $8,000 of our total budget. Uh, it seems to be based more on our budget and less on uh, the actual cost of the consultant to provide the work. Um, I think there's a lot of reputable firms out there, Rinkin, Ascent, Dudek, uh, and Wood, that uh, just need a little bit more outreach to in order to get them to bid on this. And um, ultimately, this is a very important study. Uh, and I think it's important that we proceed in a way that uh, the all members of the public can support the process. Um, and I, I do think a little bit more competition on uh, on this bid is part of that. All right. Um, that being said, is there any other questions or comments or questions on this item? Um, so seeing none, uh, we'll send this. I wonder if there's anybody from staff as well who might be able to um, speak to this item, but I'll bring it out to public comment first, and we'll bring it back to see if staff can help clarify the process that was used on this project. So um, if there's anybody who would like to speak on this item, you can uh, step up to the podium and you'll have two minutes to speak. We 
have no speakers online, Chair. Okay. Uh, David Carlson from the Planning Department. Um, I was involved in developing the um, grant application for this project, which was approved by the Coastal Commission and also preparing the RFP that we did send out to eight different consulting firms. Um, and although I'm not certain of all the reasons why we only got one bid, I am aware that there is quite a bit of this work out there right now that different consultants are bidding on. The county has had, uh, CDI has had an issue recently with getting responses to RFPs um, for various projects uh, because of just the, the amount of work that's out there. Um, I'm also aware that some of the consultants did inquire about uh, bidding on this with the um, integral consulting that ultimately we chose to award the contract to um, and found out that they were going to be submitting a bid and had already formed a team. And it was those outreach was for the purpose of trying to form a team to, to submit a bid. So, um, you know, those, those contacts resulted in, I think probably all the other consultants realizing that one consultant who was highly qualified was going to submit a bid and they decided not to. Um, that's all I can say about, um, the process outside the County. Um, but we, Followed, followed all the procedures um, in the purchasing manual to prepare the RFP and advertise it. And um, and I think we got a very highly qualified bidder um, that uh, is highly experienced in this area in, in certain aspects of this RFP in particular is the most qualified. We're, we're very confident in that and particularly the um, economic analysis that's that's uh, in the RFP. I think, I think the firm we chose, Integral Consulting, has the, the best expertise to do that part of the project. Um, and we're recommending that the board approve the contract. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, seeing no other comments from members of the public, um, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board uh, for any comments or questions. Uh, I'll move that we uh, put the study back out. Uh, to, for a rebid. Um, I appreciate the comments by staff. Um, I just feel like this is a, an item that it's important that uh, we get right as uh, more so than it's uh, urgent. Um, if on a, a second bidding, we still only have one applicant, so be it. But I do think that uh, it is possible to uh, improve outreach a little bit to uh, see if we can get more competitive bids. Okay, so we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig. Do we have a second? Okay, a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor McPherson. Um, I'll just say that I want to thank staff, um, first of all, for their hard work to apply for these funds through the California Coastal Commission and secure these funds through the Coastal Commission, and for following the policies and procedures that we normally use to look for qualified bidders on these types of projects. Um, sea level rise, especially with all the impacts we're facing right now, is really um, critical in terms of our understanding how we're going to prepare ourselves. And I just don't see, I mean, I think the staff had um, really highlighted how they reached out to all the other consultants to see if there's other people who were interested. Um, even the consultants were able to speak with themselves and that integral consulting ultimately was selected as the most qualified consultant. Um, I think that, you know, it's important that we show, especially to the other agencies that we're working with, that when the county is receiving funds, that we're doing our due diligence to make sure that we get these projects moving so that we can utilize the funds um, prior to costs of, every, of labor and all the other things going up. And um, I know that Integral Consulting has done some really great work in our community, and I don't see any, any reason today for us to delay us trying to move forward with the study that is critically important for our community. So I can't support the uh, motion that's on the floor, and I'd be willing to entertain a substitute motion if um, if there's any interest in moving this item. I'll do I'll do a substitute motion to accept staff recommendation. I'll second. I that motion some is too. Nope. Was that, there's some comments I wanted to also thank staff for their due diligence. Uh, and I agree with you know staff's comments and praise and and the recommendation of this item. That motion, once everyone is done being heard, is a substitute motion that would be heard first. Correct. So, is, are there any further comments by board members? 
Hearing none, I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote on that item. Supervisor Koenig? No. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? No. And Cummings? Aye. Is Friend still? Supervisor Friend is not on the call. Got it. So that motion fails due to a tie. All right. And so we'll bring it back to the main motion. So the original motion was to send this back out to bid. Um, and that motion was made by Supervisor Koenig, seconded by Supervisor McPherson. Um, I'll again state before the vote that I'm not going to support that motion, but we can go ahead with the roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Hernandez? No. McPherson? Cummings? No. Nope. So I'd like to look to County Council because it seems like we're not. That motion also fails. So at, at this point, somebody could do an alternative motion, or if there are no more motions, then just the item uh, perhaps will come back on your next agenda. Um, as is to see whether or not you can get um, a vote. So is there a, another motion on this item that anyone would like to entertain making at this time? The alternative motion to what was already, the two that were already proposed, or it could be the same one. You know, if, it, it, it could be, it could be the same one from a different person. If you, if you believe that you have ability to move forward with the item, uh, if not, if you believe you you've reached consensus for today, then you should probably just move on. And let's bring it back to another agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to, you know, integral consulting that we're not able to approve this contract today, but uh, I hope that when this comes to our next meeting, that um, there's an opportunity for us to reconsider this item. If the clerk may to ensure that the minutes accurately reflect where this has been left, would this be considered it did not approve or should this be considered a no action taken? No action taken. Okay, thank you. With the recordation of the motions that that were made and failed. Thank you. Okay. With that, I believe that ends, that concludes the regular um, session for today. Um, we do have a number of items that are on our closed session. I'd like to ask County Council if there's any reporting out um, on those items to, uh, that no. will be heard in closed session today. Okay. Thank you. All right. That, that concludes our regular meeting and we will move into closed session.